Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joseph Attic, Executive Chairman of ID for Africa, and this is our 29th live cast. Warm welcome to all, and thank you for being with us for part three of the Mobile Identity Management Series. In part one and two, we covered some very significant grounds in forming best practices in policy and operations. I want to take just a moment to highlight the importance of some of what we have learned just in the previous episode alone. In that episode, we explored the verifiable linkage of the SIM to the NIN, and we saw how it should be done right through an effective partnership between the mobile network operators and the identity authorities. Today, I reiterate the call to African telecom regulators and identity authorities to examine the experiences of Tanzania and Nigeria in this regard, and to consider adopting a similar policy the evidence from these two countries and others who are now on the same path demonstrates that by far, this is one policy that produces significant progress in identity inclusion. <clears throat> Despite the early pains encountered in its implementation by those pioneering it, the outcome is well worth the effort for everyone. <clears throat> we also explored the impact of mobile software and apps on accelerating enrollment and giving people control over their digital identity. The segment on tokenization of the NIN through the mobile app in Nigeria is an example of how Africa is innovating in a very practical way in privacy by design. Don't miss this experience. So far, over 16 million people in Nigeria have installed the app on their mobile phone and are using it. We also explored MOSIP's most promising extension into mobile identity, and we delved into the innovation tank, where we talked to researchers about verifiable credentials on feature phones. Those last two segments were on works in progress, and we expect to see their significant impact over the next year or two. All in all, it was a dynamic and content-rich episode, which has thus far attracted record number of views and replay on YouTube. Similarly, the, full, the first episode was full of nuggets of wisdom about reform of telecom and civil registration policies, which I reviewed in my opening remarks in the previous episode. <laughs> if you have missed either live cast, I highly recommend you watch them in replay. This is certainly content worth watching and rewatching. And while at it, please take a few seconds and remember to share, like, and subscribe. This simple act has a huge multiplier effect. It helps the movement continue to grow its reach. So please take this request seriously, and we thank you for your support. Today, we continue this exciting saga as we explore some early use cases where mobile identity has already shown a positive impact. We have four segments. I will start with an in-dialogue piece with two experts about mobile biometrics, which is ultimately needed for enabling use cases. We will then talk about its state of development, benchmarking, and outlook. Then we will examine the potential of mobile identity and financial inclusion in segment two. I will open that segment with a scene setting conversation with a researcher from a think tank considered the world's local inclusion experts. Then we will have two case studies, one from India and one from Africa. In segment three, we will have an in-depth discussion exploring the use of mobile identity for distribution of humanitarian, humanitarian aid. The final segment will then focus on mobile instruments and digital presence and their importance for economic growth of African countries, especially as these economies digitalize. We will uncover new opportunities for private-public partnerships that will enhance the digital identity ecosystem value proposition and accelerate growth. Expect a full episode with a dynamic mix of insightful conversations and relevant case studies and presentations. So stay with us till the end. Let me also share the agenda for the final episode of this series coming up on April 27, which explores mobile identity in advanced economies and will consist of the following four segments. We will start with a to the point piece with a world renowned expert on digital identity about the status and outlook of mobile driven digital transformation in Europe. We will then explore the drivers of mobile identity adoption in advanced economies, followed by an in-depth feature on interoperable credentials, such as digital travel document, mobile driver's licenses, and regional identities. 
And we end the, with the last word with a panel examining mobile risks and mitigation of the dark side, especially in the African context. I really want to thank our development partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for enabling us through their support to bring you all of this wonderful high quality content and to make it available as public digital public goods for knowledge sharing and capacity building in identity matters worldwide. Before we start today's program, I have some important information to share about the augmented general meeting AGM coming up in Marrakesh. Let me remind you of the structure of the AGM. As you can see, we will have two exciting plenary sessions on day one, the identification arena and the solution forum. An exceptional lineup of world-class experts and practitioners organized in a mix of panels and presentations. You will have plenty of opportunities to interact, ask questions, and voice your opinions about the world's most impactful identification projects, including foundational and functional programs. As a bonus, we will continue, we'll, we will continue a crowd-pleasing tradition by unveiling the 2023 AGM host country in a special brief ceremony just before we start the second plenary of the day. Then on day two, we have the exciting workshops which require an additional registration or selection step. Anyone who has already registered for the AGM will receive a link tomorrow to allow them to select which workshop they like to participate in. You can indicate your first and second choice. Please be on the lookout for that email and respond immediately. Allocation of seats will be first come, first served basis, subject to fit and merit. The first qualified 30 people in a given workshop will be the contributors of the working group and hence will be at the round table and will have access to a microphone and can participate in the dialogue. Beyond that, you will be in the observer section. You will be able to listen, but you will not be able to speak. So what are these workshops about? Let me give you a quick overview, but I invite you to consult the full concept notes on the website. Workshop one, chaired by Digital Public Goods Alliance, explores how to build digital public infrastructures or DPIs or digital stacks essential for digital transformation of government. These include digital identity, payments, and data sharing platforms. Workshop two, chaired by IOM will focus on the use of identity management and coordination best practices to facilitate cross-border mobility of people and goods amid a background of increased public health and security risks. Workshop three, chaired by UNICEF, will examine legal and policy reforms to align existing civil registration laws with international standards and best practices. It will also explore the simplification of CRVS business pro processes and the digitization to achieve Mission 100 by 2030 target date. Workshop four, chaired by the World Bank, will explore effective communication strategies and greater public engagement during the design and implementation of ID systems to improve the overall outcomes of ID projects. The objective is to produce best practices on how to collect information and data on key people-centric metrics and foster stronger communication and engagement with the public and civil society to help build inclusive and trusted digital ID systems. As you can see, the workshops consist of working groups with clearly defined objectives and expected outcomes to which you can contribute if selected. A report will be issued acknowledging the contributors and will be presented at the summation livecasts end of June. The reports will be then made available for distribution over the summer. I want to stress that the augmented general meeting represents a new format for conferencing adapted to today's realities, needs, and available resources, where we have physical and virtual complementarity. Please come to the physical meeting with the expectation that you will be active and participate in something actionable. Also, spend time exploring the exposition and experience hands-on demonstrations of technologies, products, and solutions, something we cannot give you via the livecasts. At the AGM, we have about 100 leading technology and solution providers ready to show you the latest offerings. I hope you will enjoy being part of something new 
and will contribute to its success. The AGM is a massive logistical operation that is put together to serve the needs of our community. It brings official delegations from 48 African countries, the member states of the ID for Africa movement, and attendees expected from over 80 countries around the world. Now we're ready to start part three of the mobile ID saga. The lineup today features the following contributors in order of appearance. Raul Parte, CTO, co-founder and chairman of Tech5. Bart Jan Pors, director of inclusive FinTech, <clears throat> GSMA. Saloni Tanda, senior manager, Microsave Consulting, MS, MSC. Anita Mittal, lead technical identification experts, the World Bank. Sandy Reader, Chief Information Officer, Mukuru Africa. Sharanya Thakur, Project Manager, Gravity. Um, Priyanka Patel, Innovation and Partnership Officer, the Kenya Red Cross Society. Barry Cooper, Technical Director, Senfree. Mark Straub, CEO, Smile Identity. And Gillian Hama, Group Chief Marketing Officer, Data Bank Asset Management Services. Thank you to all the panelists for being with us. We truly appreciate your valuable contributions to this live guest. I look forward to engaging with each of you within the different segments. Operator, could you please prepare segment one? In this segment, we want to try to understand the role of biometrics in the mobile context, see what options are available, how mature is the technology, and how effective are they in the priority use cases. Um, to help us uh, explore these, these two matters, we have Raul Parte from Tech5 and Bart Jan Ors from GSMA. So welcome, uh, gentlemen, to, to this segment, and thank you for being with us. I want to do a little bit of scene setting first by asking Bart Jan to kick us off. Why biometrics in mobile? Oh, uh, very interesting uh, question, Dr. Atik. Uh, let me start by thanking you and uh, the wider ID for Africa team, of course, for having me on this very exciting uh, live cast. And maybe just to set the stage for those maybe less familiar with the GSMA. Uh, the GSMA is the Global Industry Association on behalf of uh, uh, mobile operators in the wider mobile industry worldwide. So we're proud to count around uh, 750 mobile operators and a multitude of wider industry players amongst our members. And in particular, I work for the foundation of the GSMA, Mobile for Development, which aims to drive innovation in digital technology uh, to reduce inequalities in our world with a focus on uh, low and middle income countries, including in Africa. Um, but to come to your question, I think um, that sa starts with the widely known observation that um, more than 1 billion people in the world lack a form of legal identification, and actually almost half of these are living in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so that, that lack of identification really prevents people from accessing life-enhancing digital and financial services. Um, uh, we believe there is a clear role for biometrics to, to bridge this gap in emerging markets if meeting the local context needs. Um, so for instance, if attainable at low affordability, and also um, compatible with low-end technology to meet the local needs. Um, and this creates a tremendous opportunity for, for digital and financial inclusion and, and places mobile devices really at the heart of reducing existing barriers. Uh, and the role of mobile really is a, is a key enabler here. Uh, identity infrastructure can typically uh, be investment heavy, uh, roll out is complex and so on. Uh, but mobile phones really have a very deep penetration level across the African continent, and typically even so amongst uh, underserved user groups. Um, so mobile devices and, and mobile biometrics really uh, offer a huge opportunity to help lift identity barriers for people. And this holds both for foundational IDs, so really primary ID documentation, um, often, uh, of course, uh, under uh, regulation of governments. And it also holds for uh, more functional IDs. So um, digital identities that are delegated identities based on the foundational ID 
that help, for instance, improve service operation and customer experience for users. It can also help provide additional security and two-factor authentication. So and so on. There's there's really a, a multi multifold of, of possibilities in this space and opportunity for mobile biometrics. Okay, I'm going to come back to you with the issue of sort of responsible use of biometrics, etc. But granted, we're going to proceed on the assumption that mobile biometrics are needed to enable use cases on a mobile platform. So as you as you've, you've just mentioned, however, I want to sort of bring in Raúl into this conversation. Um, in fact. Mobile biometrics are not simple. I mean, for many, many years, we've had challenges in terms of their ability to function on standard of the shelf hardware and in terms of the accuracy and the limitations. Uh, Raul, you are one of the pioneers. I, I know if you go back, you, you worked with me many, many years. Uh, you were one of the wizards, young wizards who uh, started on the India project on algorithms, etc. So, welcome back. I wanted to. Um, understand from you, how do you see the challenges, um, technical challenges of mobile biometrics, and why are they challenging? And then we're going to talk about how much progress have people such as yourself and, and other algorithmic developers have, uh, have advanced the state of the art. Thank you, Joseph. <clears throat> so um, we all understand that there is a deep penetration of mobile devices and uh, you know, on the one hand, we have these awesome computing devices which have um, really state-of-the-art integrated camera systems, computing power, uh, and and uh, you know, uh, really good uh, interfaces. But then there is also a lot of variety of devices that are out there. So the challenge has been is to you know make sure that all biometric modalities can work with the these devices that are out there. And when you talk about the you know, the lower tier of these devices, they certainly lack some uh, compliances with the standards, you know, that the, uh, the like Android, for example. Um, now that said, uh, facial recognition has, you know, seen massive growth. And that's for one simple reason is the ease of use. Whereas fingerprints, you know, although it has been the most popular biometrics from the old ages if of biometrics, uh, was always seen as something that could be done with mobile biometrics or mobile phones specifically, and has seen challenges because of the optics and the camera systems and <clears throat> the physical challenges of 3D surface uh, poses, you know, when you are trying to capture that biometric. Now, with the evolution of technology, and we'll come to that, uh, there, you know, there's been a significant effort in trying to solve that problem. And we are pretty confident now that there, is solutions, uh, there are solutions out there that can meet the demand uh, you know, uh, when it comes to capturing fingerprints using uh, mobile phones. So are you, are you saying that you are going to enter a world where we will not need um, an external fingerprint scanner in order to do fingerprinting on mobile phones? Yes, I'm very confident. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, when it, okay. not only about verification, but also for enrollments, there's a, you know, it's not too far that we'll see, uh, you know, heavy usage of uh, mobile phones uh, when it comes to capturing fingerprints. Okay, you realize that this statement that you're making is an untrivial statement. And so if true, it has a very big domino effect, a major impact on how um, enrollment campaigns uh, can, uh, can work and how will they uh, procure uh, devices and instruments. And so government agencies that are watching this episode are wondering how can I be comfortable with that, that I do have enough accuracy that I could build an, a national uh, identity database having captured fingerprints using mobile phones only. Do you have any studies in the lab or can you point to us, uh, point us any studies that are done by independent body that, that will corroborate that? Very interesting question. Uh, and of course I am uh, aware, you know, people will have uh, some uh, trust issues and uh, you know, there is one validation that I would say is that NIST itself is taking a lot of uh, interest in building these tools. Let me share uh, something that uh, we have uh, when it comes to, if you see, um, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
So what you're looking at is uh, a fingerprint that is captured using a mobile phone. Uh, on the left is something with a default filtering techniques, but on the right is something um, that has been using AI and you know, domain knowledge that uh, fingerprint software developers like us or algorithm developers like have it. And you can see now that the fingerprint that is captured on the left is a contactless finger and on the right is a contact with the touch. It's pretty much similar, <clears throat> um, but this is the the final you know statement I would make is that NIST has issued this uh, tool called NFRAC, and it has been envisioned as the certification tool. So what NIST will eventually do is allow uh, technology developers to take this uh, their own captures, uh, self assess, and submit these reports in the direction of uh, literally doing an FBI appendix F like a certification process. This just shows that how seriously NIST is taking, um, you know, the the uh, NIST, you know, is taking the efforts to uh, believe in this technology and certify it. And they're also been directed by the FBI, basically saying that, you know, finally who will certify is a different question, but asking them to take the efforts into building such tools. Um, and I've also heard that FBI may start accepting fingerprints capture using mobile devices by the end of the year or performing searches against the FBI database. Mm. And um, keep, keep going. The, the NFRAC report, is that, is that issued? Or this is, you use your tool to, to assess? So this, uh, this uh, NFRAC uh, tool is issued by NIST, uh, is mm -hmm. available for, for participants, you know, by after finding uh, signing some forms. So basically they give you this tool uh, for privacy reasons. They do not want your fingerprints sent back to them. So you run your evaluations and I mean, then oh. you will send these reports and they will come back and say, uh, you know, eventually that uh, the, the, the capture technology you have is certified to meet certain, F, uh, you know, uh, standards. Mm -hmm. If you can okay. see, again, you know, there'll be a lot of uh, uh, parameters that will be listed below that talk about, you know, how good is the matching score, how many minutiae you can overlap, and certain factors that will be helping you to build confidence in the capture technology. Okay. Um, in, in order to, you know, uh, so of course there is a lack of uh, real large scale, uh, you know, uh, evaluations that are happening out there, but we as a company and technology developers, we keep our ongoing efforts uh, and I have some curves to actually, accuracy curves to show you. What we did is we took 45 different individuals and captured their fingerprints, you know, all 10 fingerprints on 26 different devices and models just to see how better the coverage is. Uh, these are the accuracy numbers. They, they can be better represented by looking at this graph. And what you can see is that with a single finger, uh, if you look at it, you know, one in a 10,000, the error rates are pretty high, but they, this is pretty similar to a touch uh, sensor, contact sensor. But as soon as you start using only slaps or all 10 fingers, the error rates basically go to, you know, uh, less than uh, uh, 1% or 0.1%. So mm -hmm. you can imagine that uh, near zero uh, error rates can be achieved using a 10 finger capture, which would be typical for your, uh, you know, for your uh, civil registration system. Mm -hmm. So, so basically the accuracy with the slaps becomes very, with, with an optical imager from the phone itself becomes very practical. In, indeed, yeah. And you can look also from the uh, user's perspective, it's very frictionless, it's pretty straightforward. Like selfie was second nature to human beings, slap captures would become. Of course, when you have yeah. operator driven capture sessions, it will be really great. Even better. Um, uh, so give some thought to, what pro programs have become uh, are adopting this for either enrollment or for for um, authentication? I'm going to come back to you, but I want to go back to Bart John for a second. Um, so, Bart, you see that there is um, a trend where we are heading into a world where the mobile phone is not just a connection device; it's becoming a very valuable. Uh, capture device. It captures biometrics. Uh, we know that it captures the face. That's already given for granted. We know it captures the voice because it can record, it can uh, communicate with voice. 
but the issue related to the capture of the fingerprint and making it almost equivalent to contact fingerprints, and plus who knows, we'll talk about iris, mobile iris. But at the end of the day, a mobile phone is becoming a multimodal biometric capture device. Should we have any concerns about that? Um, I know some humanitarian organizations are raising the alarm bells saying we should be careful about mobile phones being used for biometrics. Are there any issues that we should be worried about? Um, well, I think this is a very complex theme, of course, in general. Um, what we think is, is extremely important to make sure that the biometric solutions that we address in the context of Africa are also um, meeting the needs of the African context. A lot of the technologies in biometrics evidently uh, evolved in more developed markets. And those learnings um, can definitely be leveraged bringing those technologies to Africa, but not as a one-on-one -on -one copy paste. Um, so if we look at that, I think the first thing to note um, is that there are several components to that. So um, you're thinking, of course, right away about particular use behavior or digital literacy amongst others. But I think there's two specific ones that need to be addressed if you bring biometrics uh, to the African continent. One is the affordability of investments, um, because a lot of the uh, businesses are running on low margin business models. And another thing really, and I think this is also where you're going, um, is compat compatibility with uh, user equipment. Not everyone will be in the position of an iPhone 13. So it has to be compatible with low or lower end devices as well. And that's really the challenge at hand to see how those different modalities that you mentioned, face recognition, fingerprint recognition, voice recognition, can be carried over to that context of, of these uh, type of constraints and those type of devices. And that's what we've been looking at as well. Now, I'll come back to you on that. Um, Raul, it seems that on a low end um, infrastructure, um, a single biometric may be vulnerable, may not be as robust. But if you allow me to capture, as you mentioned, the entire slap set, then just, or, or augment that with the face, even if the image quality is, is not as good as you would be in a high-end device, are we achieving the good enough? Are we reaching the good enough in a, in a context such as the, the real world in, in hard conditions? Do you think mobile phones are achieving good enough and therefore they're becoming game changer for mobile biometrics? Yeah, so um, as you saw that, you know, when I was uh, displaying those slides, uh, there were 26 different models that were included in the test. And our, uh, you know, starting principle is that you have to, you know, make sure that at least 80% of the market is covered, uh, which means, you know, we're starting with medium range to high end phones. Uh, and as you said, uh, <clears throat> that, you know, uh, capturing multiple biometrics modalities always solves the problem. And uh, that said, there is also, this problem has to be solved from two ends. One is the capture side, but also you're you know, enhancing and building new algorithms that can handle such variations, right? So there has been a significant research into neural network based fingerprint matching algorithm to be specific. As you have seen that what AI has done to face is also doing to the fingerprints. So yeah. when you're still trying to bridge the legacy fingerprints to mobile captures, there is a little bit of uh, friction there, but when you start to go contactless to contactless or using new AI-based matching, I think the, the problem will, is definitely solved. So you basically think this is the AI revolution that's now we're seeing its impact in multimodal biometrics, making mobile viable? Indeed. Okay, hold on to that. I wanna come back to you. Um, Barja, um, obviously, your organization does not do research in algorithms for mobile biometrics, but obviously with the plethora of players in the field and the devices and the platforms, there needs to be some sort of uh, benchmarking, some sort of mechanism and platform that allows your customers um, to start exploring these wonderful innovations without having to only rely on what vendors are claiming, et cetera. So what is GSMA doing regarding biometrics in the mobile context? 
Indeed, of course, as an industry association, GSMA is not providing direct solutions or technologies to the industry itself. We have the role as an enabler to bring the industries together, supply and demand service providers and technology providers. And as such, we have uh, two and a half years ago uh, launched the GSMA Inclusive Tech Lab, which is a facility really for and by the industry where players can work together on innovations that help drive digital inclusion and specifically financial inclusion in the space of mobile money. Evidently such a key financial service across the African continent. Um, and what we've been doing in that space when it comes to biometrics is that we've built a, uh, uh, a demo platform, um, which we call Biometrics for All, uh, which really provides a multimodal biometric showcase for enabling digital service providers to test different biometric solutions uh, for different uh, use cases in emerging markets, tapping into those different modalities of face, fingerprint, and voice, uh, all using a safe environment. Let me leave it uh, for here at this moment in time. Do, do, you, do you have an overview visual that could illustrate what the DBLL does? Yes, I can share uh, more about that, of course. Let me pull yeah, just, it out for you. Yes, very quickly. That should be so this is BLL. Now. You've got the you've got the link on on the on the top. So anybody who wants to join, um, this is open to uh, only your association members or anybody. No, it's absolutely open source for anyone to tap anybody. into and make use of. And really, what it aims to do is that it provides. Uh, uh, digital service providers with a facility to test those various biometric modalities and, and different use cases they're interested in, which can be simulated within this ball biometrics for all environments. So what we really want to achieve is to reduce the challenges with adopting biometrics, uh, allowing a better understanding of which kind of biometrics and what type of solution would fit in their specific business purpose. Okay. Okay, that's that's great. I mean, it, it, so basically, this is going to be uh, a knowledge lab. At the end of the day, hopefully, you will develop um, enough tracks, tracks, and, and 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 knowledge that that you could counsel some of the uh, your your customers about what works and what doesn't work in certain use case scenarios. Yes. It is indeed okay. a knowledge lab, uh, so we provide all sorts of uh, knowledge products around it as well, but it goes beyond. It's really uh, technology that we provide, open source assets that can be taken by any service provider to their benefit and adjusted. And if there's support needed from us to adjust that to their specific uh, purpose, we are available to support that. Excellent. Come back. Um, the audience, anybody wants to join Raul and Bartjan? Um, raise your hand or just step up and we, we can we can talk about um, basically biometrics. I want to continue with Raul. Um, Raul, have you been also exploring um, mobile iris or do you don't see demand for mobile iris? Actually, Bartjan, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so um, indeed, yeah. So uh, we, uh, as an uh, organization, are trying to solve uh, two problems, right? The last mile problem uh, which is capture of biometrics and also verifiable credential that can be held in an offline manner. And uh, along with the face, finger, and voice, uh, we are definitely researching into iris. Uh, and the challenge is going to be, how do you make iris images from an, uh, you know color camera compatible with a near infrared? And again, we're gonna you know, uh, trust the, 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 the power of AI or machine learning and we're gonna spend in, you know, our efforts into that direction. I personally would uh, believe that, uh, or want to believe that it can solve the one-to-one -one problem for one-to-n, we will still have to wait till the whole ecosystem evolves where there will be some kind of near infrared, uh, you know, light sources that can be attached on the device. So mm -hmm. I hope by the end of the year, we'll have some, um, you know, news on, uh, on the, that approach. Good, excellent. So we've got somebody from the community who stepped up to the plate. Please introduce yourself and explain uh, who you're with and where you're from and state your purpose. Hi, my name is Hans Marschleck. I'm from uh, New York City. Uh, my company is called Bandwagon. It's a travel app. Um, uh, my question to the panel is, when we collect multimodal biometrics in undeveloped countries, who is going to store those 
um, since it doesn't have the particular model of Apple, which is like the on the device. And um, how do we keep those type of things safe since only one, uh, you know, once you have it, you have it forever. Um, I'm thinking specifically to the issues of, uh, you know, intergenerational violence inside uh, Africa, uh, like Rwanda, where different tribes are fighting each other because they knew of the biometric uh, or, or the tribe affiliations and how do we step and prevent that? Thank you. So, so basically, Raul and Bart, um, when you're talking about biometrics collection, where will that biometrics go? Will that biometrics go into a database? So this is a, for the enrollment, but for the authentication, what are the models? Maybe that would be a chance for you to also talk about offline. So uh, as you mentioned, yeah, capture is only the part, it's part of an ecosystem. It's a registration right. system and you'll take care of registry, encryption and all that stuff. But when it comes to authentication, where you want to do offline verification, uh, we're working on technologies that are basically more around the decentralized identity. So we, wherever there is a lack of digital skills and digital infrastructures, uh, we are promoting technologies and building technologies that can work offline, but at the, uh, without compromising the privacy and security aspect. What does that mean is that anything uh, that needs to be uh, verified by a authorized officer will need consent either in the form of biometric password or a you know, input that somebody can um, you know, provide like a passcode or something. That way, it, you know, there's nobody that can actually get to your data unless you consent for it, right? Uh, and when you do it decentralized, there is no honeypot. So there is no one database that somebody can use to uh, you know, commit atrocities. So this is something that we are working on. Uh, it's already a, a solution that's out there uh, and it's uh, you know, proving its benefits when it's working in the offline manner. Okay. So you can actually um, carry your own biometric, maybe in a QR code and a 2D barcode or something, and that, that would be um, in, encoded and secure, and you don't need it to be in a database, right? Exactly. Uh, it's something that you can print or show it on a mobile phone. Anybody who has the author authority to uh, verify it can read it using a smartphone, and on the spot, you can do one-to-one -one yep. verification. Okay, excellent. Um, Mamadou? Toyota, Kuyate, can you please state who you're with and your purpose? Welcome. Please uh, un unmute, unmute yourself. Okay, je pense que c'est ouvert. Et oui. moi, je suis euh, un responsable du fichier électoral au niveau de la CENI guinéenne. Je suis okay. le chef de service administratif et technique euh, au niveau du fichier électoral. Attendez, Donc, attendez. Ma question vais, à ce niveau est que... Attendez, euh, Mamadou. Est-ce que vous avez un peu pensé... Euh, oui. Mamadou, je vais expliquer que this gentleman oui. is in charge of the electoral... Oui. Uh, oui. Elect electoral database oui. in Guinea. Um, Est-ce que vous pouvez uh, poser oui, votre question? Yes. Est-ce que vous pouvez? Oui, on vous attend. Est-ce que vous pouvez poser votre question? Je, je, peux, je, peux, je peux traduire. Oui. Ma, ma question oui. est que euh, si le, 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 ce que vient d'expliquer euh, par vient d'être expliqué par rapport au réseau mobile. Euh, Est-ce que vous avez pensé aux personnes inalphabètes au niveau de l'Afrique? Parce que s'il s'agit de s'identifier, c'est une question d'inclusion. Est-ce que les personnes qui, 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 euh, 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 inalphabètes peuvent se retrouver pour que et plus que là, c'est une question qui est importante chez moi ici, euh, où vous pouvez, vous pouvez voir qu'il y a à peu près 50% de la population qui est inalphabète. Donc, yes. qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire par rapport à cette situation? Et ça, c'est ma première question. La deuxième okay. question, ceux qui n'ont pas d'appareil performant, ceux qui n'ont pas de système mobile performant, tel que les iPhones ou les, les Samsung euh, et puissants qui peuvent euh, mieux reporter cette donnée, Comment peut-il faire pour réellement euh, s'identifier? 
Okay. Et là, je pense que c'est des soucis que moi, j'ai. OK. Merci, Mamadou. Basically, the question comes to building reliance on biometrics on mobile phones requires that the person is at least illiterate and also has a, a highly performant mobile phone. So what, what is being done to test the, the extent of inclusion? Uh, how, do we, how do we build solutions that allow illiterate people to use them and also people who don't have a high-end phone? May yeah, I take that one, Dr. Atik? Yes. 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 Um, I find it a very relevant question. And that's actually also the context that we address within the work I just presented, Biometrics for All, which is really aiming to include people, all people into digital infrastructures by lifting those identity barriers. So really looking at how biometrics can help that in the local context. So um, uh, the work that we do, and I can give some examples, is really based on work that we do in collaboration with partners in markets. Uh, for instance, work that we've done with a major operator uh, providing mobile money services in Pakistan, Telenor, as well as recent work that we've done in Western Africa with one of the leading mobile money uh, providers and, and mobile operators. So really the platform that we've built is very modular and flexible in terms of modalities, in terms of use cases, in terms of suppliers behind it. And so it can be tuned and tweaked to the needs of those partners. And they really understand the context of their markets and also understand exactly those barriers that you mentioned, Mohamedou, in terms of digital literacy. Um, one of the voice modalities, for instance, that has sparked particular interest by both these players in Pakistan and Western Africa is around voice, because mm -hmm. voice is very intuitive and can be addressed to apply to many types of use cases. So be it for uh, providing a secondary factor of authentication on top of PIN, or be it for providing an, a, a means to do, let's say, low-end security operations like resetting a PIN, or also be it for doing high-end security operations like authorizing transactions at the merchant location. So all these type of examples, we've actually contextualized and built in practice for those partners to really experience what that would look like for their end users with the experience sets that you indicate, Mohamedou. Okay. okay, okay, very good. Actually, Raul, I'm just we're running out of time. I want to come back to you. Uh, your your fingerprint um, matching is very intriguing because if 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 it becomes a trend that everybody will use to capture fingerprints on large scale enrollments, this has a huge huge uh, impact. Um, are there any countries now that have begun using um, mobile fingerprints captured by a fingerprint ca by a camera to do enrollment or not yet? No, no not enrollment yet, uh, because as I said, you know, there is a little bit of a trust uh, that has to be built. And right. when NIST uh, and everybody starts to publish these reports, there will be more trust. There has been a lot of uh, traction in authentication and hitting national databases in many countries. Uh, but we have now serious engagements with some, some countries where they are considering this for registration purposes. Do you care to make a prediction? Do you think how long will it take before countries start enrolling people on mobile phones without scanners? If I, um, <clears throat> you know, if things go as planned by the end of this year, you'll see a very large program using mobile fingerprints uh, to, you know, capture and deduplicate. And we're talking about tens of millions of people. Um, it's a very okay. big program. Okay, so I think this is this is a major development, and you've heard it here at ID for Africa Livecast. Raul, if this is the case, we're going to bring you back, and uh, you're going to share with us the details of that program. Uh, Barjan, you you and your Biometrics for All laboratories will be validating that these are actually um, real game changers um, that are going to open wide the enrollment and the use cases um, for for on, on mobile. So we ran out of time. I want to thank you both for, for your wonderful presence with me and for the insightful conversations. So thank you again, and we'll hope to see you back again very soon. Operator, please um, uh, prepare the next uh, panel. I actually will start with the first insightful conversation, and then we'll add, we'll add the, the, the people to the panel. Um, in our second, uh, in our second section, um, what we wanted to do is um, 
actually um, Saloni. This is our our uh, second segment, which kicks off the panel on on um, financial inclusion. So the first question is obviously I've introduced you as a researcher from um, a think tank which is known as the world expert in local inclusion. Say a little bit about yourself. Uh, tell the audience where you're coming from and, and what qualifies you for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Attic, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Saloni. I work for MSC Microsafe Consulting. Uh, I've been in this uh, space for quite a few years. In the last, uh, uh, for the last three to four years, I've largely been working with a lot of government institutions in India, uh, where we've been trying to focus ways to make sure that uh, the most vulnerable segment is also included in the fold of financial services and social protection. And through that discourse, we've been able to come up with a lot of nuanced insights as to what works, what doesn't work, what are the key issues at the last mile which keep getting neglected. I also work in the space of gender uh, and financial inclusion, so that intersection. Um, okay. I hope that's it. Yeah. Well, let's call you the local expert on inclusion. So speaking of inclusion, um, how serious is the problem of exclusion in the world? Where, where do, what do we know about it in your research? What have, has it tracked in terms of how serious this problem is? Um, so that's that's actually a, the most fundamentally critical question uh, that we really need to keep uh, our sight on. Uh, the latest FinTech data that we have access to, uh, which was released in 2017, we're all waiting for the 2021 uh, data set, uh, says that roughly 69% of the adult population globally is uh, now included in the fold of financial services, uh, which essentially means that as a, as a community, we've all been able to progress tremendously. From 2011 to 2017, it seems like we've added 1.2 billion individuals in the fold of financial services, which is, which is huge progress. And that's largely happened because a lot of countries have come together to uh, sort of sign uh, national financial inclusion strategies and commit to this larger cause. Uh, but at the same time, what we've seen is that there's a huge uh, gender gap that has persisted and it's, it's stuck at 9% percentage points since 2011. Uh, the other critical thing is COVID, which has uh, recently, uh, the estimation is that it's definitely put us all back. Uh, and uh, we are anticipating that 1.2 uh, billion individuals, 1.7 billion individuals for that matter, are still financially excluded. So I actually have a slide that will help uh, everyone. Show, show us. Yeah, show yes. us the breakdown. Uh, that would be good. Uh, put, it, put it on, on uh, slide. Okay. Do you see my slide? Yes, yes. So 69% of adults to, in 2017 are banked. Uh, hopefully we've done better than that since since then but let's work with that. That's the hope, yes. Uh, now, uh, like you mentioned, Dr. Attic, the question uh, is, is pertinent because financial inclusion just does not refer to uh, the number of uh, people who have a bank account, right? It also matters how much they're able to use bank accounts. So a lot of institutions and now governments are trying to look at different segments within uh, the population when it comes to financial inclusion. And, and one simple categorization is these four segments that I've now displayed on the screen. Um, at Microsafe, uh, what we've also started doing is uh, that to be able to understand, because just because you have a bank account does not mean that you're actually the user. So essentially what we've been able to do through our research is that uh, we've been able to identify four different types of users of financial services. Uh, so you have a proxy user, an irregular user, which would essentially mean that the segment is underserved. And then you have more advanced users and regular users. Uh, our estimation is that in seven developing nations, uh, which would include India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, um, we have uh, almost uh, roughly 230 million women that fall in this category of segment three. So it's in, uh, in, the, in this category of segment three, essentially that means that uh, they are underserved. And then an, another 200 million women that are completely excluded, which is a huge chunk, right? And women, um, as we all know, are completely, astute. They're, they're on a back foot at this point of time. So yeah, in the snapshot, this is where we are when it comes to the status. So, so 422 million women are excluded out of the 1.7 billion adults 
that is only for seven countries. Over 22 million are concentrated in just seven countries. Just seven uh, the countries. Exclusion, uh, the exclusion is actually 200 million. 422 is all these three segments cumulatively. Okay. So they're underserved as well. Yeah, they're regular underserved. They're regular users and the proxy users who are who don't have control over their own. Okay, so it's a, it's a big number. Okay, um, what what else can you tell us about that? The the, the knowledge we have about the exclusion. Um, this um, is basically you've assessed it, you've characterized it. So we expect a significant number. Do we have any knowledge of, of what it looks like in, in places like Sub-Saharan Africa or that data is not available? Uh, so essentially, uh, we are trying to put together a lot of data sets and we have values. Uh, we've been able to use the FinTech data and other local country level data sets to come up with country level uh, subsets or you know estimations for this point so uh, we have those estimations for a few countries I'd be happy to show that but not for sub-saharan Africa as a complete region we're still uh, working towards it okay okay so in any case come, come back to the screen in any case yes. the problem the problem is a, is a serious problem we're not talking about a problem that has um, several million people we're talking about problem that potentially could be over half a billion people um, who are out of the system and financial inclusion. And we, as the topic of our series is mobile, uh, we believe that there is potential for mobile phones to act as a medium to reduce financial exclusion. So I'd like to understand from your analyst perspective, how do you see mobile phones potential to try to eliminate that large number of excluded people? And, and, and help turn them into well-served um, people? Um, so mobile phones, by, by the inherent uh, nature or the fact that they can reduce the kind of opportunity cost that individuals face compared to, say, the traditional brick and mortar model, mobile phones do have a lot of potential. Uh, but the way we see it right now in the field, uh, there is also uh, the way it's being deployed currently, uh, there's a lot that still needs to be done. Uh, so for instance, right now we can categorize the way in which mobile phones are being used for financial services into two different categories of models. Uh, the first model uh, can be understood as a assisted model where uh, there are there is a field force deployed by say the financial service provider. Uh, the field force will go at the doorstep of the segment of, of the customer and help them conduct this transaction. So essentially onboard them on the system and then help them conduct this transaction. The other um, model is more of a self-assisted model where you use your own device to use uh, to onboard yourself on financial services and conduct transactions on a uh, but on a specific frequency. Uh, but essentially, in terms of how much this is happening or how successfully they've been able to include the excluded is a question, and and there is a lot that is left to do over there. So. so I, I see you a little bit skeptical. There is some hesitation in your voice about the potential of mobile. It seems that this is not just a technology issue. There's something much more that needs to be needs to be put around mobile in order to make sure we achieve the desired outcome. So, so could you reveal more about what is needed to succeed here? Absolutely. Um, so. Essentially, to put it very uh, crisply, so mobile phones, uh, mobile for financial inclusion is not the silver bullet. There's, there's a lot to do. And, and actually, to explain it, I can again um, show something that we have from our research, um, okay. which is essentially, yeah. Can you can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah we can. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if we look at it in very simple terms, uh, again, this is just a simplified classification of the population, we can assume that our population has around these six segments, right? And the first three segments would be the most vulnerable uh, segments that we're looking at, which includes the oral segment. By that, I mean individuals who can who cannot read or write, but they know how to count money. So they have their own system of doing it. Then you have women that are vulnerable by virtue of being uneducated, by virtue of coming from very low income categories. And then you have other vulnerable individuals. So apart from gender also, income and education level makes them more vulnerable. Then you have the rest of the population as well, which we have again segmented. Typically, as of now, again, this is a very generalized understanding for everyone uh, to come on the same page. The extent to which they are excluded from financial services can be understood very simply in this manner. So the oral segment and vulnerable women are typically extremely excluded and uh, the rest follow. 
Now, if you look at the, if we're going by the same classification that we had previously of the assisted model and the, the self-operated model, if you look at the assisted model, my understanding is uh, they will not be able to cater to all the vulnerable segments by virtue of its model. So, for example, uh, because of a lot of bottlenecks that say the oral segment faces, uh, even if the field force goes, they are not able to, currently at least, they are not catering to this oral segment uh, for a lot of reasons, which are are also related to say lack of uh, purchasing power or lack of interest of the FSP. Similarly, uh, in the case of self-operated models, because the individual himself or herself has to use this phone, uh, they need to have ownership of this phone. This, this model in itself excludes a lot of these vulnerable segments. So uh, to sum it up, despite having these two models, our three vulnerable segments are highly excluded. So mobile phones are actually not, uh, I mean, it's not disabled. There's a lot that we need to do and it's not just scaling up the technology, but but much more. Okay. Yeah. When you say much more, what, what is much more? What, what do we need to do? I'm so excited you asked because I have uh, a lot uh, to share okay. on that actually. <laughs> so um, a way to understand that would again be to look at the a typical customer's journey when they're trying to use financial services, right? And uh, it, again, very simplified terms, uh, we've tried to come up with this customer journey where you have these uh, six stages, um, seven stages, sorry. And essentially what happens is uh, in, the assisted in the assisted model specifically, the field force will come, they will help you enroll, they'll probably help you do the first time transaction. Now, eventually, as an individual, see, I'm, an, I'm, the, I'm, an, I'm a part of the oral segment and I want to do a repeated transaction. It's going to depend on two things, my own interest to do it and also the field force's interest to come back to me and support me. So there's a lot of um, dependency on an external factor, per se. Uh, there's very little uh, that the individual themselves can control. Uh, and also a lot of uh, things when it comes to grievance, resolution, etc., becomes a function again of the field staff. Uh, compared to this, in a self-operated model, apart from just a simple marketing or uh, you know process to help the customer be aware that you have this application to onboard yourself, there is very little assistance again that's given to the customer. Uh, so in that sense, the stickiness of this model is a little uh, is it's not there; it's just missing. Uh, so if we again look at it from the perspective of say, the customer's morale and confidence, uh, it keeps going up. If I am a person who is a part of the vulnerable segment, my confidence and morale and interest and motivation to be financially included will keep going up till I do the first time transaction with the support of other individuals. The, the minute I need some grievance support, at least typically the models that we have right now, the systems that we have, they don't really look at these avenues in detail for these segments. So my interest is going to crash. And this happens with both these kinds of uh, models. So Essentially, the point I'm trying to drive across is that technology is not just uh, the only thing that's needed. We need human touch. We need a lot of handholding support to be able to turn this into a, a clear tool to make sure that the excluded actually start becoming included. Does that answer your question? Yeah, actually it does. Um, but I wanted to understand a little bit better sort of what ultimately, I mean, you, you've uncovered sort of the, the underlying impediment. It's not access to technology. It's basically access to a human experience that is repeatable, that is uh, that feels secure, that feels comfortable. Uh, what, what is your advice to governments that are struggling, trying to achieve achieve um, uh, financial inclusion? This is not something that e they can easily create regulations and, and, and insist on the banks to do certain things or the mobile network operators. Do you have any insights in that? If you do come back to the screen and let's talk a little bit about them. Right, uh, so essentially there's, there's a lot that the government should start doing. Um, I think one critical thing is to make uh, find ways to make sure that FSPs are incentivized to actually start looking at this vulnerable segment a little more seriously. Uh, I, I, there is a lot that can be done. So perhaps um, it could start with regulations as we've uh, seen in some previous episodes also, some experts also suggested that regulations actually, it, it means a lot of push for FSPs and for maybe mobile money operators as well, but it can actually eventually make them take notice and understand if there is a business case and push them to start uh, moving towards that direction. The other thing, a very critical thing is that um, there are a lot of processes before 
technology as well. For instance, when we look at the use of, uh, of banking or the convergence of mobile uh, with the banking system, we understand that IDs are again extremely critical. Uh, now, uh, and the digital divide is real, like we all know and we've seen. It's, it's inspiring to see how in this previous uh, session, we could uh, see that there are a lot of innovative ways that are coming up to help make sure that uh, verification for the ID happens. But also there are processes beyond that. For example, in India, even though Aadhaar is a game changer, if I want to open a bank account, a lot of banks have uh, their own set of rules. They want your local ID as well, apart from your Aadhaar card. So for instance, if I'm a, I'm a laborer and I move to another location, they will need an address proof, a tangible address proof from a verified entity uh, to prove my address as well as my Aadhaar card. If the name mismatches in these two IDs, uh, I'm out of the system. They will not entertain me. If my date of birth does not match or if my date of birth is just a year and in a lot of rural contexts, vulnerable individuals don't really know their date of birth. So when they get their Aadhaar card name, the, the kind gentleman or female who's helping them make the other card is just going to put a random year saying, oh, you look like you're 60. So let me just put it as 1962 or something of that sort. So again, that creates issues. Fixing these things right now is not easy for the vulnerable segment. It's, it's extremely challenging. There are a lot of mobility issues involved. Uh, there's a lot of complexity involved. Processes are just not simplified. Another thing, and then moving aside, uh, not just looking at the government, but also for FSPs, I think there is a lot of um, uh, the oral segment per se. It's a huge chunk. Right. Uh, globally, I think 14 percent of the population is assumed to be excluded uh, or they're not uh, they're not educated. So you're basically excluding a whole chunk of individuals because your current processes, protocols, interfaces, they do not uh, they are not simple enough for an uneducated, illiterate person to use. Uh, for example, there's a lot of work that Microsave has done with uh, Brett Matthews from my rural village and and um, the there is a lot that can be done through icons. For example, there was a research where it showed that if you have a plus sign, which we all assume plus is adding money into yeah. your wallet, um, it, it, it is actually perceived as a sign for medical emergencies by the vulnerable segment because outside clinics also you have a plus sign, right? So there's, there's a lot of scope to support the oral segment to start using these interfaces by just fixing these icons, co-creating icons with them and fixing them. So uh, there's a huge scope there. Apart from that, a lot uh, that the government and FSPs together can do is find ways through which you can convey information uh, to these vulnerable segments. So for example, through a lot of research, we've seen that women typically rely on their own trusted social network. If you have a third person coming in and telling her, hey, this, this, this piece of uh, you know, application is useful for you, she's probably not going to listen. Uh, she will trust it when her friend or her uh, family member is going to inform her. So if, if everyone could come together, find these nuances and then develop solutions that are relevant for these segments and also push these solutions through these uh, relevant and effective channels, it could be a game changer. So you, not only do you have a solution, but you're actually conveying it in the right words to this segment. Okay. And so basically, uh, there is no silver bullet here. There is a need to pay attention to humans and what they what their capacity to understand uh, look for exception handling making sure that that in, in most cases a system with a protocol can cover 95 percent of the people and 90 percent of the people but there's always 10 percent of the people who will have a need for exception handling that should be simple that should be friendly and not feel give them the feel that they're being pushed back because the computer is unable to onboard them or because they have a small exception. Um, maintaining the data quality is also important. Maintaining ways for people they can correct their data or they can update their data so that they don't fall into uh, a trap where, where they become excluded, not by design, but by consequence of something that was oversight. Um, do you see a role for the civil society here as uh, accompanying people? We, we've had examples of, of civil societies such as Namati in Kenya, for example. They understand the bureaucracy of systems, and so they accompany people. Uh, is this something that's worth um, replicating everywhere? I, I think there's a lot of merit, at least for the first few times, Till the individual feels like uh, he or she can use the financial, the, the product or the channel 
uh, easily with confidence. There's a lot of merit to have such systems in place. So for instance, in India, we do have say bank sakhis. Uh, we do have uh, the whole self-help group uh, mechanism where one or the other individual becomes a champion and then she helps the entire group conduct transactions at a financial service uh, point. Okay. So there's a lot of merit. Uh, essentially, I think the key becomes that all these stakeholders need to converge and work together. There's a lot of scope to do that and, and they currently work in silos, which is very sad. There's so much that we can achieve together. Okay, so basically to, to wrap up, do you remain optimistic about the potential of mobile phones to bring together, to bring out uh, positive outcomes for financial inclusion? I am optimistic, but uh, with caveats, with an asterisk. <laughs> uh, with cautiously, the hope that we are cautiously optimistic. optimistic. Yes. <laughs> okay, wonderful. We, we are going to continue to track that caution. I think we will learn a lot of lessons from that caution. Uh, are there any reports that we can, uh, that people can reach out to, governments can reach out to understanding some of the issues that you talked about? Um, Absolutely. I'm sorry. Yes, please go ahead. There, there where, are... where, 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 would they, where would they find them? I, I would be happy to share a few links over here. I can also... Uh, 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 sort of, you can also look at them up on our Microsoft website. There are two particular reports that I think a lot of people would find useful. One is a recent framework called the Debit, uh, where we have been able to figure out a quantifiable way to understand which channel will an individual use to conduct transactions. So essentially, that means that if uh, even if you have a banking correspondent right next to your door, um, it is not necessary that this yeah. vulnerable uh, woman would actually go and use it. She might use a bank that's just 10 kilometers away or 10 miles away, uh, depending on how she perceives each of these points. So we've been able to compute a way, a framework, to assess how she actually perceives these different points and how does she choose a channel. And using this could actually help us understand where we're going wrong with a particular channel. So is it trust? Is it hand-holding support? Is it a lack of confidence and so on and so forth? So that's one. The other is that uh, a couple of years back, we were able to map the journey of first-time users of DFS, uh, and that included uh, women and men using mobile uh, for financial transactions as well. And we used uh, a new framework to do that. That brought us a lot of new insights. So for example, women will not run after cashbacks or small incentives. They will run after an option that reinforces that their money is safe. Uh, like, and it's, it's extremely essential, right? So they need a lot of hand-holding support, and they will not try anything alone unless and until uh, that is com completely reaffirmed. Grievance resolution yes. is completely reaffirmed. So, Aloni, we ran out of time, but these are all right. wonderful yes. insights. And I encourage everybody to look up these two reports from your website. Thank you so much for joining us for this insightful conversation. Uh, actually, we want to move on to a case study. Operator, prepare the next person. One government that has done well um, in, in this regard is India. And with us here is Anita Mittal from the World Bank, who is going to give us the perspective on how India, through the use of payments and um, digital identity, um, uh, has managed to achieve, improve the, the, the financial inclusion. So, um, uh, Anita, thank you for joining us. Um, guide us through how do you see the successes of India and how we could learn lessons from it to be replicated in other countries. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Atik and Editor Africa for giving this opportunity to run through the story of how mobile can contribute to financial inclusion uh, with the example of India. And let me quickly share some of this information through slides. Yeah, so the financial inclusion in India and it is through the Trinity of Janathan, Aadhaar, and Mobile. Before I start my presentation, I just wanted to look at the numbers. When we say India has shown remarkable progress in financial inclusion, let us see with our own eyes what this progress is. The FinTech survey shows that the number of people about the age of 15 from 2014 to 2017 this growth has been from 53% to 80%. So 80% of the adults have a bank account. And if you look on the right, you will see what is the growth story of this mobile payments. It is every year in the last four years, there has been doubling of the 
number of mobile payment transactions as well as the volume uh, in terms of the financial value of the transactions that can be done. And this financial year, we have reached $1 trillion uh, landmark. So some of you must be knowing the answer, what has led to this success, while others may be wondering, how did India pull this off? What led to this phenomenal growth? So let me reveal the answer here. And this is the Trinity, the famous Trinity of India, which is Jack or Jam, Janadhan, Aadhaar, and Mobile. And the central piece in this is the Aadhaar, which is the digital identity program of India, which was launched in 2009. And today, 99, over 99% of the adults have this identity, unique identity, based on duplication, based off biometrics. The second component of this Janadhan program, which is an Indian term for public money, and this was a national mission for financial inclusion, which provided for a basic no frills account to any person who wanted it, just on the basis of using their Aadhaar identity card. They didn't have to keep any balance in the account, which was very important for the poor and the vulnerable who could not even keep a few dollars balance on a month to month basis. This was launched in 2014. And the third component, which is the subject of this presentation, is mobile. So India, as of today, uh, has about over a billion mobile phones, of which 750 million plus are smartphone users, and we still have 400 million plus feature phone users. The average consumption of data, hear me properly, 12.5 GB per person per month. This is no small number. And the second number is more startling. One GB of data costs less than 10 cents. So let us see how these three components have grown over the years. If you look at the identity system, which was started issuing ID in 2010 11, it has grown exponentially to cover the whole population. If you look at the Janathan program, that has also grown exponentially to cover a wide the coverage of the population, both male and female equally. And the penetration of mobile has been phenomenal. We have almost, at the end of 2016, 90 phones per 100 people, as per the World Bank data. So you might be wondering, so how has this mobile increase has contributed for financial inclusion? We all know how we use a mobile in our daily life, right? We use it as an alarm clock, we use it as a timekeeper, we use it for shopping. Tell me anything and we think with the different apps we're using mobile for everything. But now I'm going to show how mobile wears different hats in the domain of financial inclusion. And each of these hats is a synergistic relationship with each other. So moving on to the first rule, so the mobile works as a credential, as a digital ID, enabling you to prove who are you. So I can say I am Anita Mittal, and somebody will believe that I am Anita Mittal. This can be done both in online and offline environments using a mobile app or a QR code stored on your phone. If you want to prove that I am who I am saying, that is I am Anita, Somebody wants to believe it for approving a transaction or for giving consent that can be done on future phone with OTP or by a click of a finger on a smartphone app. One thing I would like my audience to notice is that in India, if you see all the features going forward, you will see that it is available not only on the smartphone, but also on the feature phone because we realize that we have to be inclusive if we want to achieve shared prosperity and remove poverty, which are the twin goals of the World Bank too. So if you look at how mobile worked as a financial address, you can see that people don't remember what is your account number, what is your IFSC code, what is a switch code. But since decades, people know what is a mobile phone number. People are used to remembering mobile phone numbers. If I have to say I need to pay an amount, 100 INR or $100 to the person with this mobile number, 
it is very easy for the literate and not so literate to do this transfer. And this is done not only on a smartphone, but on a mobile phone using the USSD channel. Uh, and star nine and hash is the universal service which is provided across different telecom providers. So if I want to type this, I get a menu option where I can say send money. I enter the mobile number and enter the amount. And then with the second factor of authentication, which is a pin, only I will remember for my account, I can approve the transaction. So it is secure and very easy to use. If you go to the smart, use the smartphones, you can even say pay so much $100 to a contact from my phone book. So you can use your phone directory to pick a contact to whom you want to make a payment. In the India version of WhatsApp, the mobile payment option is integrated as a menu option by which people can pay, make mobile payments using their WhatsApp application. Now let us look at the next hat, which the mobile device wears, which is working as a your credit card, debit card, or a digital wallet. I don't need to carry a wallet with lots of credit and debit cards. The mobile phone works as my wallet, whether it's a feature phone or a smartphone. In the feature phone, while you have the USSD channel for other services, it's there for making payments too. A new service has been launched recently, a few months back, wherein people can use the interactive voice response service or the missed call service and hear voice prompts, based on which they can do mobile payments. And we have a plethora of mobile payment apps running into three digits now, about 100 or so where you can use any payment app from any provider to bank account from any bank. So this is the beauty of the open standard and protocol called Universal Unified Payment Interface, which is India has created as a digital public good, which is allowing anybody to talk to anybody without any vendor lock-in. And during the COVID-19 pandemic in the year 2021, 9 billion contactless merchant transactions could happen through mobile payments. Now you don't need a physical brick and mortar bank branch. Your mobile device works as your mobile branch, bank branch. Whether it is a feature phone, you can make payments, check your balance, do your last transactions, as well as install mobile apps for your bank and do many more advanced operations using your mobile app for your bank. And this has the added benefit that it reduces the operational cost for the bank and allows people and banks to get a better customer experience. The load on replenishing the ATMs and the bank branches with cash significantly is reduced because everything is happening on mobile. And this, the last feature which I'm showing you, mobile is a QR code. This is a total game changer. India had less than 5% of the merchants offering point of sale device with credit card and debit card. But this scenario has changed drastically. In the last five years, 100 million QR codes have been deployed in the market for accepting merchant payments. Whether we need a sophisticated a uh, shop or a hotel accepting mobile payments to a street vendor or even beggars or wildlife where you want to make donations, you just have a QR code attached to your uh, you know, vending device and people are able to make payments even at a street signal using this without worrying about change for very small transactions. So this has been a real game changer for the small and micro merchants. While we have said that the three critical factors were the trinity of jam, there are other factors contributing to the success of this mobile payments. The first I would say is the regulatory ecosystem, a role very well played progressively by the central bank with the well-defined regulatory framework and providing a regulatory sandbox 
in which a lot of innovations have taken place and multiple services which leverage financial mobile payments have come up. The government has encouraged through several incentives, tax and non-tax, investing in financial literacy program, setting up a robust payment infrastructure, which is capable of supporting billions of transactions per day and supporting both on smartphone and feature phone, all the services to the different projects. This has really contributed for everybody to get included. The investors have also contributed and supported the fintech startups and innovations furthering the growth of mobile payments. Supported by all this, the payment service providers have taken on this innovation and provided multiple services, bundling them, bringing ease of service to the people. And this is available in multiple languages. India is a country of people and languages. We have 22 official languages, and these applications are available in multiple languages, making it easy for people to use this mobile apps and newer business models by providing take now, pay later, or insurance and other incentives have been bundled along with this payment feature. Besides this, I think there have been other environmental factors like the demonetization program or COVID, which has equally contributed to the growth story of financial inclusion and mobile payments. I just want to take a last minute to explain that how this penetration is deep in, among all the people. You will see that 80% of the person to business and 60% of person to person transactions are less than $10. 80% of P2P are less than $30. So it shows that we are using this not for high value transactions, but people are using it for daily, day-to-day -day users for very small activities. And how does the future look? Well, what we heard from our government is that we are looking to reach a billion transactions a day in the next three to five years, continuing our growth trajectory of doubling every year. With this, thank you for listening to this Anita, interesting story. Yeah, come, come back to the screen, please. <clears throat> Well, thank you so much for this fascinating and exciting um, uh, account of what happens when digital identity is coupled with payment systems and is coupled with a powerful platform, which is mobile. And this is the model that I'd like to see um, all African countries look very carefully at identity in context. And this is the type of thing that we're going to explore in the annual general meeting uh, with workshop one, for example. I have one uh, quick question for you. Um, when did the regulatory sandbox um, get formalized in India? And um, we talked about the regulatory sandboxes being put in place in the first episode for civil registration. And we said it was important in the financial uh, sector. It showed, they showed uh, important results. What was India's experience with the regulatory sandbox? So the regulatory sandbox provided us to experiment with different uh, innovative products in a regulatory environment to observe, experiment, right. and see what would work, what would not work, to improvise and correct before rolling it out and uh, rolling it out in a market. But scenario. when did they formalize the concept and put it in place? Is this 10 years ago? Is this three years ago? When did India start experimenting with sandboxes? I'll have to check back on the okay. regulatory sandbox, which year they really started, but it's available in the open domain on the RBI website. We can see where when okay. India started it, and I'll put it in the chat. Uh, okay, so, so that's one point that's in, important, and I, I recommend to all governments that are listening to look into allowing regulatory sandboxes, especially as ID systems and payment systems are evolving and they're not getting fully functional. The other thing which was sort of very, very interesting is how commoditized, how cheap data became in, in, in India. You mentioned one giga uh, was less than 10 cents in India. 
Mm-hmm. Now, what would you attribute that to? Do you attribute that to pure market forces or is it that the in competitive meaning or is that the government has created the right incentives to allow people to get on the internet? What's behind it? So I think a big role was played by market players. If you see in 2016, there was a telecom company called Reliance Geo, which entered the market with such attractive packages that 10 telecom companies were reduced to three. All the small players were literally, you know, had to wrap up their bags because they cannot, could not compete. And these economies mm-hmm. of scale, which this model right. was taken by this big player, Reliance Geo, really brought competition and all the telecom MNOs, they were in a race to reduce the prices. And India has also been investing in the digital infrastructure of this connectivity with uh, different programs and the no fund. So clearly lessons, invest in more digital infrastructure so it commoditizes, it makes it cheaper. Important role, the, again, the mobile network operators will play in this. They, they, when we talk about the future economy, when we talk about the digital identity and payments, you cannot ignore how important the mobile network operators should be treated as a partner in this. You cannot build identity authorities who don't talk to mobile network operators anymore. So, uh, Anita, wonderful insights. Um, I enjoyed listening to you. I uh, hope to see you in Marrakesh um, in, in the annual general meeting. Until then, uh, please stay safe. Um, operator, uh, can we continue with the next um, next individual? Actually, Sandy Reader, welcome, who will share with us um, a case study from the Mukuru experience in Africa. Welcome, Sandy. Please tell us who and what is Mukuru? Maybe I'm saying it even wrong. No, you're saying it right. Thank you, Dr. Atik. Uh, lovely to be with you all today. Um, and let me share some, some slides that I put together to talk about the Mukuru story. And um, just to provide some context on sort of who I am and to sort of start um, to share my perspective. First, let me share a little bit of Mukuru's tr- credentials. We are a platform business already serving Africa's emerging consumer. Um, and you know, as Dr. Attic and Saloni were talking about earlier, I was getting so excited because the story that you're telling has been our story in Africa, and we really focus on the SADC region. So, um, you know, some of the data that I'm going to share comes from our remittances product, which particularly focuses in and around South Africa, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Botswana, and Lesotho, uh, and 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 so it really is in the heartland of, of where people don't have a lot of data around what's going on in in Africa. But, you know, what we've seen is it's not just about the tech. It really is about a human element when you're dealing with a financially underserved market and you're trying to address financial inclusion. And so Makuru has been able to focus on meeting our customers where they are. And some of the stats I've got up on the screen show that repeat use and stickiness really does happen when you create products that, that serve customers' needs. Typically, digitalization or digitization in, in, in the financial services world means creating that simplified bank account, going straight to the digital store of value. Um, but what Makuru has done is we've used the world of mobile to unlock a digitized financial profile on that mobile channel, but not asking our customers to take what for them is a financial leap to actual mobile cash, to digital store of value. And so we've utilized mobile digital channels to sit alongside a purely cash-driven transaction. And 60 to 90%, and I use that range because the data is so varied when it comes to sub-Saharan Africa, but in our region, 60 to 90% of payment transactions are still happening in cash. And so if you utilize digitization and you come in and say, I have to digitize the financial store of value, well, it's a bridge too far very often for a financially underserved individual in our region, particularly a migrant. And that happens to be the population that we really serve in a cross-border um, money transfer transaction, which is where a lot of the data I will share comes from. And so we believe that financial inclusion and digitalization is actually a journey. And you start not by digitizing the tender type, but by digitizing channel usage and putting someone in control of their financial destiny without asking them 
to put their money into this crazy mobile cloud thing that they don't understand, um, but to utilize simple digital channels that put you in control of that financial transaction and still allow you to execute that transaction in cash. So you really start by digitizing the channel and that comes down to access to mobile channels that are really accessible to this particular market. It cannot be a really bright, shiny app on a fancy smartphone because our market still is operating similar to the Indian case study just shared. Our market is definitely operating on 2G financial phones. USSD is a critical, critical channel. And so we need to meet those customers where we are. You then can walk them down a path to understanding mobile use cases, what the options are when you understand and control a financial transaction, even if the tender type is cash, to then move them over to enticing um, the world of, of digital payments. So paying for bills, a couple of utility bill payments through digital mobile wallet, now you actually have taken a customer on a journey to first understanding channel opportunity and control um, via mobile devices, and then getting into really the sweet spot which is all of our goal in financial inclusion, which is to bring customers in to a digital store of value that they can use regularly and, and, and really gear up and, and, and support their lives. Just in terms of some of the statistics, uh, Saloni mentioned that there's two models. There's sort of the field force model and the self-service model. And up to 90% of customers um, to the year ending February 2021, which is the last stack bar that you can see there, were signed up and through our field force agent sort of sign up model and um, from the year sort of was March 2020 until February 2021. And yet 80% of orders are being created on self-service digital channels. So 43% of them on the USSD channel and 32% and of them on our WhatsApp um, channel offering, which, which has been a really exciting change. So evidence that if you really can create products that customers need and meet them where they are, um, that, that you can get that stickiness and transfer from a field force model into a self-service model where people can start to really earn their own financial agenda. So it starts with the digital onboarding use case. So as we've discussed over and over again and through various speakers today, digital access, once I am a financial transaction customer, could be varied. But the sign-up use case, the digital onboarding use case is just so important. And so we have had to work really closely with regulators in sandbox environments and understand our market and particularly what grassroots remittance transactions look like in SADC across the markets that I particularly mentioned. And we've had to look at what the barriers are to the sign-up use case which really creates that massive financial exclusion. Because even if I wanted to, how do I actually sign up for your financial service product? And it comes down to what is the mechanism through which I can identify myself. And, and so we've taken a dual approach. We really look at our core self-service channels and we look at the limitations of those channels. We then take that back to the limitations that can be put in place around a really, really simplified remittances product that would allow a grassroots, currently excluded person to be financially included in the purpose of cross-border trade. I mean, it's cross-border remittances to put food on the table for someone back home. And so looking at USSD as an onboarding channel is something that we have started to look at. And as I've mentioned previously, it's a really massive channel in our world. But USSD is so exciting because there are no device barriers to entry. Um, I was listening to, to the conversation earlier, Bhatian talking about what GSMA is doing in terms of biometrics for all. And that is so exciting because in Sub-Saharan Africa, that's really what we need. We can make that channel free to the end user. It's simple. It's familiar. If you have an m and if you have a phone and you're dealing with your m and in terms of buying airtime, et cetera, you are using USSD. So it's, it's a great channel. The challenge is, of course, that I can't submit a document through that channel. So, so we need to work with, with how we can then identify these customers. WhatsApp has been an amazing um, step up for us. Chat apps are familiar, familiar they're present, and they, they really up, pro provide a huge ease of use market opportunity. Very often in Africa, data is, stored in social, is sold in social media bundles. 
And WhatsApp is part of that social media bundle. So if I can put a financial product onto a WhatsApp channel, I'm once again lowering the barrier to play uh, because I don't have to buy data to, to access that channel specifically. And then, of course, we also have our feature-rich self-service channels in terms of apps and websites, et cetera. But in terms of, of the statistics that I've just shown you, the usage on these channels in terms of the volume that we process in, in, in SADC, uh, this hits about 5 to 8% of that volume. Customers are voting with their feet, and they want to go to simplified mobile channels that really support their journey. So how have we been able to really get into a space where we can start creating financial services access for someone who cannot find us? We, we don't have a, um, a brick and water branch network uh, that, that covers Africa um, properly. And, and, and in all honesty, I don't know of a single organization that does. Um, the field agency, the field force model is, is a great model. Uh, but there are a lot of rural areas within Africa that are hard to get to, and, and, and you shouldn't be excluded from financially, financial products that are game-changing for you just because of where you're, where you're based. So we've had to go right back to how do we actually onboard that journey through a mobile entry-level entry kind of device. Um, and we worked with the sandbox environment with our regulator in South Africa, supported by um, a company called the Finmark Trust to really look at financial inclusion and what could we do to design a product and a, finance and a, and a um, customer due diligence process that really meets that customer where they are. Um, and so we designed a, a product that really is only accessible to kind of grassroots um, customers that have previously been financially exclusion for the purposes of sending a remittance home, but we're talking tiny values here. Um, on average, less than $20 being sent per transaction um, and to a total cumulative limit of 140 US dollars a month, um, which is the RAND equivalent of what you're seeing on the screen. And, and that product allows someone to sign up in a USSD flow in terms of capturing their core data. And then we phone that customer and verify that data over the phone. It's not voice verification quite as yet because the the authentication element is not there, but we can do customer due diligence all through your um, feature phone. And that has been a major unlock for the start of a financial inclusion journey. 60% of those customers upgrade. They are able to ultimately move to a place where they either can buy some data, utilize the WhatsApp channel, get into a city where a field agent can find them. And they are able to then upgrade to sending sort of 1,700 US dollars equivalent a month because they can and, and do suddenly have access to a channel where I can capture their legal identification document and still utilize things like ID selfies um, in that moment of capture to do the document verification. And then of course, there's a framework that um, if you want to kind of move up in financial services um, uh, products, if you want to take out a financial wallet, um, and if you want to start sending more money than that, well, then the, the documentation and, and additional due diligence goes up. But this framework and, and our regulators providing us with a risk-based approach option has really opened the door. And I think governments, you know, it would be amazing if we could see more sandboxes in this space, if we could have better access to government sources of, 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 of identity um, coming through an APIs we can look at. A reduction in data costs is huge in Africa. These things are prohibitive and very difficult. And there is a need for financial services and digital literacy education at a, at a national level to support this, this baseline. My final slide is just some evidence that if you start talking to somebody in their cash journey by giving them an access to a digital channel rather than forcing them to digitize the value, you really do start moving people along a financial journey. And so you can see um, when we took a snapshot in February 2020, 70% of our transactions were purely cash to cash. But in February 2022, we'd moved to only 49% of those transactions being cash to cash. And a digital store of value at the start of that remittance transaction was really becoming real for 37% of those transactions. 
Uh, Sandy, Sandy, excellent, w wonderful insights. I wanted to ask you, actually, you've taken one of the hardest problems of financial inclusions, which is movement of money across borders. Uh, it's basically um, remittances, uh, but it's also a use case that is in certain migratory worker environment drives the need for that. Um, <clears throat> do you think remittances is a good place to start and, and work with the regulators within the region to allow you to, to build genuine national-based financial inclusion to allow people to have stored value, to allow people to have bank accounts, uh, to allow people to make payments within their country, or there are actually quite a bit of confusion and you are in a very special environment where the static region uh, does allow you for, for sandboxes. How would I take what you've learned and take it, let's say, to West Africa? So I, I do believe that, and, and certainly some of the UN research supports this, remittances can be a, particularly a recipient of a remittance. It is the first stepping stone financial transaction that some people ever engage in. Right. So displaced individuals, the migratory population that is huge in Africa, and we have to deal with the fact that Africa has become a massive migrant melting pot. Yeah. Um, and governments tend to look at um, processes that work for their own citizens, and then the migrant market is excluded within that space. And, and, and that is very difficult when there is a lot of migration happening within Africa. And it's a lifeline, it's, it's like a lifeline transaction to a recipient back home. It's very often the first digital financial transaction they will ever encounter in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so if you can work with this in terms of understanding that it is typically cross-border, everyone thinks is very high risk, but low yeah. risk cross-border person-to-person remittances for the purposes of feeding families, paying medical bills and paying for school fees are exceptionally low risk. There is an opportunity for us to create sandbox environments there. And there's an opportunity to look at the barriers to entry when it comes to identity management. But Sandy, How do you prove someone's identity? Sandy, does that require coordination between regional governments? Does that require basically, short of regional identity, what kind of coordination do you need regional governments to be involved? Let's say the host country will be will be okay with sandboxes, but the initiating country is not comfortable. How do you overcome that? I, I think I think co regional coordination would be would be wonderful, and if our regions can start having this conversation, because these are all of our people that need right. help. This is our people, this is our setting. So we need right. to address this. And I think I think regional conversations would be very helpful, but you know, it doesn't have to be formalized. The, 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 the lovely nature of FinTech is that we can kind of take that social web and work with it. So no government needs to be hugely involved in a big program if they're prepared to let non-local organizations like ourselves access their their, their national identity systems, I can deal with that problem for them. And actually, brilliantly, we've just started to work um, with the Lesotho government to do just that in a sandbox. And so we're really excited about that. What's your ambition in terms of uh, reaching pan-African reach? Is this something that you imagine? Absolutely. So our stronghold has been in SADC, and, and, but I think I'd love to take our learnings and our product and, and, and move into East and West Africa and there, I think you have the wonderful opportunity in that certainly in East Africa, there is a very strong wallet mobile community just ready to kind of be involved in, 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 in the movement of, of financial flows in the remittance space, but who are also possibly looking at that, that step up kind of simplified bank account. So somewhere between a bank account and a mobile wallet, as we know today, um, which I think is a niche that we could fill quite well. Excellent, Sandy. We ran out of time. Thank you so much for these insights. We hope to hear more wonderful news in the future about your progress. Thank, Thank you. you so Operator, um, let's move to another segment where we talk about, in fact, another form of remitt remittances. Actually, that segment is going to involve the... Um, Actually, sorry, Barry, that's not your segment. That's going to be the Red Cross Society from uh, Kenya and Gravity who will you talk about mobile use cases in the humanitarian context. Um, sorry about that little confusion. Uh, we'll get to that uh, digital presence segment uh, just following that. And so with me here, Sharanya Takur from Gravity, 
and Priyanka Patel from Kenya Red Cross Society. Welcome both of you to this segment. Thank you for being with us. Um, I wanted to start by asking Priyanka uh, sort of what is the problem that the Red, Kenya Red Cross Society was facing that you needed to solve? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this. Okay. Um, first of all, yes, that's Pri I'm Priyanka. I work with the Kenya Red Cross Society um, as the innovation lead. And uh, we've done quite a number of projects in Kenya, um, you know, from doing distribution of food aid to non-food items. Um, and every time there's a disaster that that strikes, it's always the challenge has always been around how do we offer our aid and services to the community or the vulnerable communities for response, but also in the case of preparedness. So um, and pretty much like other organizations as well, we, we moved into cash transfer. So we started doing cash transfer uh, pro programming to the beneficiaries or the vulnerable communities in this case, where we would give them an amount of uh, $30 per month and we would take in their details so that we're able to then always keep record of the, you know, the cash that is going out to the community side, but also for accountability to the donor. Now, the challenge that always brought uh, to us was, you've got two groups of, uh, of vulnerable communities. You've got those that have national IDs and those that don't have any form of identification. And for Kenya Red Cross, who an organization that is affiliated with the national and county government and is auxiliary as well, you need, you're always held accountable in terms of how services are provided, especially when it comes to cash that goes out. And every time we talk about money, things become very sensitive. When you talk about beneficiary data, it becomes even more sensitive and, and you know, difficult. But then the question was, if we're trying to address the issue of sensitivity, then we need to at least ensure we have, uh, we've, we've, and like we've got collection of every single information that a beneficiary needs to share for him to be verified, for us to know that this particular person is for real vulnerable or is for real um, in that position that, you know, if there is a flood uh, disaster or there's a drought situation, he or she or this household is positioned, is in that particular position of being affected. So we have our own assessment systems internally, but then, what we do at the moment uh, or previously was we used to issue um, cash voucher assistance uh, vouchers and cards. So these cards had unique identification and, and uh, barcodes for, for, sorry, QR codes for the beneficiaries. And at any given point when they need to withdraw cash and the entire, sorry, the entire cash transfer system runs on a mobile money platform. So we disperse money through mobile money, which in, in Kenya, it's through Safaricom, which is called M-Pesa. And we ride on the rules and regulations that KYC has set around this network provider. Um, but then there's a the restrictions that uh, if you don't have a SIM card, I mean, if you don't have a national ID, you can't purchase a SIM card. If you can't purchase a SIM card, you can't use mobile money. And as Kenya Red Cross, we can even do a bulk purchase of SIM cards on behalf of the beneficiaries and distribute these to the beneficiaries, but you can't register them on M-Pesa. So it still beats the purpose of why are we buying the SIM cards if we can't use them for mobile money. So then we started doing airdropping or not airdropping in that case, but then we identify nearby merchants or our agents that uh, use mobile transfers or mobile money, uh, which is M-Pesa. And we give them the list of uh, beneficiaries uh, that are to receive cash in that particular month. And then they do the, dis the, the disbursement first. And then they bring us the invoice on our side of the report for which we then re repay or send them the transaction uh, for the money that was initially used. The challenge that perceives is uh, every agent doesn't have a float of that kind of money to initially distribute. And on our side, we can't do an initial uh, send off of money or an airdropping because in this whole aspect of accountability to make sure that money is not taken away and it just, you know, we just lose it, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so of course we go through a whole procurement process of identifying these agents, but then the KYC regulations of not being able to register an MPESA always remained. So we identified this, um, we came up, you know, we came across the solution of creating digital IDs where we'll, 
the beneficiaries have better ownership and access to this, this um, digital version of their identification. And you don't necessarily need to have um, a smartphone or access to a computer for you to see your data. You know, you can write on the OSSD platform and you're being registered. And that's where our partnership also with Gravity Earth has come in. Um, this is something we're doing with the IFRC and Innovation Norway. We're testing it out, we're seeing, and we've done the first pilot in Turkana and Madare. And it's just like taking a moment and thinking out of the 7 billion plus population across the world. We have 1 billion of people without IDs, at least those that we've accounted for in, in the reports we've seen. Out of these, um, the right to get assistance, humanitarian assistance, you can't do that until you've got any form of identification. And as a national society or as a Red Cross and Red Crescent, any national society within the IFRC, uh, for us it's all about neutrality and equality. So regardless of you being a civilian, a citizen, or a refugee, or someone who's just lost their na national ID because of um, relocation or a disaster that you know damaged, destroyed their house, we still, you know, we still have to consider them for the humanitarian aid. Right, and the Priyanka. So, so let, let me try to understand this. Somebody would would have said, "Well, you, you're giving them small amounts of money. Um, doesn't the fact that they exist in in a zone that's very affected?" Uh, entitle them to be to get assistance um, you give them a coupon it's used one time it goes away why do you need to know who they are well we need to know who they are because how structures or communities are settled uh, within the local level here on ground is there's a lot of movement right so mm -hmm. there is no way of holding someone accountable we can't take word of mouth for trust, for instance. So we work with the county governments and the local area chiefs also for identification. So currently how we do it is we have a manual process of this. So you come to our desk or we come do door to door visits and we take your details at least. And then we go to the chief, the area chief to verify validate. that this person is actually registered. Yes, to very well okay. this person is um, residing here. So you established the yeah, need sorry. for identifying beneficiaries. Uh, there wasn't any alternative. Many of these people don't have a Kenya national ID. Uh, no, so there's two versions, as I said. You don't have everybody not having Kenya national IDs, but you have a small group that don't. And let me just correct it there is you could have registered for a national ID. You had access to one, but you've lost it. And there's a whole process to renew your ID. Mm -hmm. You need okay. to go to the police and all of that. And then also the other reason we're doing that is, is because every time there's a disaster, you'll find 10 different organizations going on ground to collect beneficiary data. It's such a tedious activity for yeah. the community Be that has been affected. Because yeah. there is so, no social register, in fact. If there was a no. social register in the country, then it could be universal. Hold on to that yeah. thought, Priyanka. I want to go to Sharanya and understand, you know, Gravity is known to be an organization that works to develop digital identity solutions that are actually uh, user-centric in the sense that they empower people without relying on centralized databases, etc. So you got the call from the Red Cross Society of Kenya and... How did you react? How did you see your solution as the exact fit to solving the problem that you, they needed? And we'll come back to you, Priyanka. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Attic, and also the entire ID for Africa team for inviting us and organizing this. Um, so just to address your question, um, our when we saw the request for proposals for this solution, we had actually already kind of been active in this space, um, working with the UN in Turkey as well on a similar sort of use case. Um, and we kind of knew that the solution we were developing, which um, is called self-sovereign identity, um, is a perfect fit for this kind of, um, this kind of ecosystem uh, for two reasons. Firstly, going back to what Priyanka said, you have multiple organizations that are collecting data over and over on the same kind of individuals. Um, from the user perspective, of course, you know, when you're in a strenuous situation, this is a less than ideal experience to constantly have people coming to you to ask things. But let's look at also in terms of how this reduces the efficiency. So when you have um, organizations that collect the same data, 
Um, of course, that means each organization spends its own resources on sending out the manpower to collect that data, to be able to uh, neatly transmit this data from the field to the storage, um, storage area. And so you have all of these sort of um, organizations that are just repeating the same activity and they are you know, spending public funding um, on this. So there is this efficiency side of things, which you know, having tested our solution in Turkey, we knew that self-sovereign identity is particularly good at being able to solve this. The reason for that is because um, in a traditional sort of foundational ID system, um, each time an identity credential needs to be verified, there has to be a callback made to the issuer. Um, and, and this is where self-sovereign identity is different because rather than making the callback to the issuer of the data, you are making a callback to the holder of the data, which in this case happens to be the beneficiary of assistance. What that right. means- Shania, yeah. explain, explain self, self-sovereign identity a little bit better. How do I, I am somebody in the field, how do I get my identity with you? Um, could you please explain to our audience? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess the most important thing is that, um, first I will maybe start by saying what self-sovereign identity is not. It is not a replacement for foundational ID. Mm -hmm. Uh, In no way are we saying we're giving you legal ID. The Mm -hmm. second thing is that it is not a data management system or an enrollment system. It is a storage system which Mm -hmm. governs how different entities within an ecosystem are able to access this data. So very concretely, what that means is that let's say you are someone who lives in a remote part of Kenya Um, and you have the Kenya Red Cross go out to enroll you in a cash transfer program. They have their own data management tool through which they collect information on the the beneficiaries. Now, you as the beneficiary of assistance at this point have nothing to do with the identity system. You are just giving your information as is, and this is how the system is built to be able to uh, be integrated into how different organizations collect data. Um, Once this data is collected, the actual enrollment takes place once this data is transmitted from um, this data collection tool to the uh, self-sovereign identity system. Um, And so once this is done, what what happens is um, a decentralized identifier is created for each individual. This is like a national ID number, for example, except that uh, it's a little bit longer and there are certain different components to it, which I won't get into, but it's a unique number to identify Mm -hmm. each entity. Once this is done, depending on what kind of device you have, you receive information with how to go about uh, accessing your identity information and uh, also uh, managing your identifier. So this is in a nutshell how the user um, of a decentralized or self-sovereign identity solution experiences this. Uh, Sharanya, where does the the identifier information reside at that point in time? Who who has the database? Yeah, great question. So um, as I mentioned, self-sovereign identity is basically a way in which data is stored and the access to it is managed. What this means um, concretely is that it relies on two kinds of storages. One kind of storage is a public storage. Um, Why is this? Because this public storage needs to be uh, accessible by um, by different entities in an ecosystem. And for obvious reasons, it needs to be managed publicly because if I give, let's say the government of Kenya control to manage uh, this, Uh, public directory, then clearly I have to make the call back to the issuer. So we don't want that. We want it to be sort of a public common. What is this public storage? In most cases, it happens to be a distributed ledger, which in our case is a blockchain. So at this stage, the the identifier which is generated is this goes on the blockchain because you want entities to be able to access it and to be able to manage it. The second part, the second storage is a private storage, which is called a credential repository. As we know, we don't want data um, that is personally identifiable going on the blockchain. It conflicts with the right to be forgotten since it cannot be erased later. So we need a place where private information can be stored 
um, so that, you know, in case it needs to be deleted later, the user has full control to do that. Now, this private storage, where does this reside? So this is where the interesting part comes in. If you are a user who uh, has a smartphone, um, then this private storage um, is basically a cloud and you're able to then grant individuals access to uh, this private storage on the cloud uh, through your smartphone and the smartphone application. However, if a user does not have a smartphone, which happens to be the case with Kenya Red Cross beneficiaries, um, then this storage is held by the Kenya Red Cross, um, which in this case um, is what we call a guardian organization. Why do we call it a guardian organization? Because it is this entity that is responsible for storing the data on behalf of the beneficiaries. And when a beneficiary initiates an action, for example, saying share my data with this financial service provider, then the Kenya Red Cross has the right on behalf of that beneficiary to share that data. But it must be initiated from the data subject, which is the beneficiary in this case. Okay, so this is a very interesting concept. You're, you're introducing to the ecosystem the concept of a guardian because of the very fact that uh, feature phones will not have the ability to connect to the cloud to give the, the access to the entities that need to have access. So, and, and, and the guardian receives USSD um, channel-based messages from the owner of the phone? Exactly, yes. Okay, and that individual would basically say, um, move, share, is this, a, what is held? Is it, is it my, my credentials, my digital credentials, my digital certificates, I give yeah. access, sign. that's what you do. It's the digital credentials, which it's are verifiable credentials. credentials, yeah. Okay, and so they sit at the Red Cross, and mm -hmm. but they are controlled by the owner. Yes, right? exactly. And so, so then, okay. I understand. So hold on to that. that. That's an interesting concept. The concept of a guardian so far in this series has not emerged. And we talked in the in the first episode, in the previous episode, to the use of feature phone for identity management. But the concept of adding one layer, which is a guardian, will allow a feature phone essentially to manage identity. That's a brilliant exactly. way of, of doing that. Okay, so uh, let's hold on to that one second. I want to come back to Priyanka and, and, and understand the concept of operations, not the technology, but the concept of operations from the perspective of the vulnerable individual who is trying to get their cash transfer. So how does this work? I, I need to have a phone. How does this work? Um, sure. So we've, we've got two models. Uh, previously, what we've done is we've gone to the different households uh, door to door to do the registration. So how cash transfer works is we do we have a ground assessment first every time the disaster um, has hit. And once the assessment has been done, we've identified how many households have been affected. And keep in mind, cash is distributed uh, based on households. But digital identities are created based on individuals. So when we're doing cash transfer, it goes along with the digital identity saying that you, for you to access the cash, you need to have some sort of identification to present so that we can distribute or you know, include you in the cash transfer process. So we first need to identify how are they registered in the digital ID uh, platform at the first phase in Turkana and Mathari was when we, we went to those households and we would of course have to first take their consent. So you gather their consent, uh, you let them know about this, this pilot first, first of all, uh, because it was it is a pilot and you tell them that this is what we want to do with the information that we collect. And this is how it would reduce their stress moving forward when a disaster hits. So that information is then after it's it's collected, um, the registration, you, you do the registration process with them in right next to you. So as you're filling their data into the system, into the device, you're getting them to either do it themselves as you guide them along, or you do it with them uh, if they're of course, um, like impaired in terms of reading or understanding the words. Um, once that has been done and the system has, I mean, the information has been uploaded, then you give them the access to the, you know, how do you access our in, your information? This is what you need to dial and this is how you get it. So every time uh, they do that, they're presented with a certain uh, 
password or passcode. I don't know exactly what it's called. I'm sure you can correct me on that. Um, it's a really long, uh, I, I know the new way of getting passwords, um, but that's what they're given for them to fill out. And then they're able to then access their data as well and their information on their side. Even for us as a national society, as, as she said on the, on the Guardian side of it, we have access to that information, but we also um, only a certain individual is given access to that information in terms of cash disbursement or in terms of managing that information on our servers. Um, if, if we want to give rights to another person uh, to access it, there's a whole procedure on our side as well, because we have to give respect to the data privacy and the data policies on our side. Now, but, but once when registered... I just want to use it, yeah, well, I registered, I'm done. So what happens in the month after month? Yeah. So once you've got the registration done, then from, from our side is just to um, automatically we, we upload that into our system and we do mm. the cash disbursement from our side. So what happens is the list of phone numbers um, is then sent on to the, the network provider who then disperses the cash for those that have IDs and SIM cards registered. For those that don't, then we send that information to the merchants or to the to the people down on ground because we have county branches on ground. So we have um, teams on ground that have volunteers and staff. So then they're also responsible for accountability to make sure that this cash reaches these community beneficiaries. So the beneficiaries that, with, that don't have the IDs then actually go to this counter and are able to then present their, their identification or their, you know, the, the SMS on their side, the confirmation, and then they're able to receive the cash, as opposed to how it was being done before, where you would have to take, they would illegally buy some SIM cards, and then they right. would share mobile devices. Okay. Um, and then share passwords as well. So there's a lot of identity theft then, theft. because uh, you don't have ownership collusion. of identity. Collusion. Excellent. Okay. Sharania, uh, what other use cases has, is Gravity working on? I and mean, where do you see this sort of I saw self-sovereign identities? And I've also heard you mention sometimes dignified identities. Is that is that a term Gravity is using or is that a term the digital, the Red Cross Society of Kenya is using? Who, who's behind the dignified identities? Maybe I'll let Priyanka answer the dignified identities part of it, um, and then I'll jump on to the other. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah. um, it's actually a term. It was a term uh, from from our side with the with the International Federation of the Red Cross and the Crescent. Okay, so that's yeah, that's because the concept we're, that we're not trying to yeah. Yes, because we don't want to say just digital identities. We need to make sure that we, we put more weight onto it so that there's more accountability on, on that side as well in terms of responsibility then. Okay, okay excellent, excellent. Okay, um, Sharanya, please explain where is gravity going with this? I mean, this is a very fascinating functional ID that can be used by anybody for any application. Where have you been uh, doing it? Uh, right, so there are two other use cases. Um, so. Uh, Gravity in itself, um, we have built as the basis of all of our products, a self-sovereign identity product. Now, what we realize is that self-sovereign identity, and this is something that other players in the self-sovereign industry market are also experiencing, is that no one is going to sort of say um, one day magically that, hey, I want my identity to be handled in this amazing, secure, dignified way. So you need to create use cases that are attached to access to services, which then incentivize people to be able to use the self-sovereign identity side of things. So what does this translate to for us? What this means is that we build applications that are use case specific on top exactly. of this decentralized or self-sovereign identity uh, stack. So one of the major use cases we have is for um, identification and humanitarian aid. And that's the one we're currently discussing. The other two are um, uh, supply chain financing, where we help create um, financial identities for uh, small and medium sized enterprises, specifically uh, mom and pop stores in Kenya, to be able to um, pull their business related data, identity data, et cetera, from different sources, and then push this towards lenders who can then use this data to score them and then you know, um, extend credit that is suited to their need, but also, um, you know, be able to really access a segment, which as a lender, you previously could not access because there was no data on them. So that's one side of things. And then the last uh, sort of use case that we have is for credentialing. 
and this is the work that we have done with the uh, with the UNDP and also the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Turkey, where our solution was um, used to help uh, refugees um, assemble their education credentials from different organizations that were uh, providing them vocational training. And then to be able to take these education credentials and then share them with employers, but also other education institutions so that they could improve their operations, but also then be able to sort of add more aspects um, to this identity created through these credentials. Actually, I find it very, very fascinating because what you're doing, you're changing the game of what identity is about. It's actually you're putting identity to the service instead of spending the time arguing whether we should build foundational identity or functional identity and then ask what is the use case that's going to come afterwards. Mm -hmm. You start with the use case and you build a purpose fit identity platform, which retains the control into the privacy control and the control over somebody's identity exactly. in their own hand. Um, I find the supply chain um, example, which is essentially you're, you're venturing into creating credit bureaus in a way by exactly. allowing layers, which is something that's a huge, huge gap. And here's a powerful identity platform that's able to solve a problem. And all of this is actually being built on simple channels, digital channels like USSD platform. But I understand that you are inclusive in the sense that you can be on any digital channel, including smartphones, if the pe people have it. Yes, correct. So, I mean, that's one of the aims that we have. One of the things with self-sovereign identity for all the amazing talk it gets, one of the biggest constraints, of course, is the use of cryptography. And, right. um, you know, this obviously leads to barriers in who can adopt it. But our vision through this guardianship is different. We want to make it as accessible as possible. So you're absolutely right. And um, with the Kenya Red Cross, we actually even managed to um, push our solution out to those people who don't have any phones by condensing everything in just a QR code. So, okay. yeah. Excellent. Uh, we ran out of time. Unfortunately, I want to thank both of you for this wonderful and insightful conversation. I think I, I urge everybody who's seeing this live and also on replay on YouTube to look these case studies up and follow up. This is identity worth implementing because it is making a difference in the lives of people who need it most. Not the people who already have million types of different identities, but the people who for them, this could be the difference between getting their cash transfer and being able to put food at the, on the table for their family and ending up being hungry at the end of the month. So wonderful, very insightful. We, we, we thank you for taking the time to be with us and we hope to see you again um, soon. Uh, operator, please bring in the, the, the start of the third panel, which is going to be about digital presence. Uh, we're going to start with... Um, an interesting, as always, uh, insightful and keynote level presentation from Barry Cooper from Senfree. Barry, you're no stranger to the livecast, so welcome. I'd like you to guide us through this segment um, on digital presence and its impact in digital economy and, and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Attic, and uh, thank, you, thank you for inviting Senfree on, onto the panel. Um, let me just start with my... Share my slides quickly. Um, so, in 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 all in all the work that that, that we have been doing, um, particularly in financial uh, um, uh, inclusion, uh, let me step back and just give you a, a, an introduction of who Senfri is. Senfri is a is an economic impact agency. We are we we aim to um, solve complex problems in developing uh, countries with a view of unlocking welfare. So we started on, on the identity uh, trip many years ago, particularly in financial inclusion. And uh, quite quickly, we, we discovered that it's not just um, uh, financial inclusion. You really need to fill out the, that entire puzzle. Financial inclusion is one of those, but there's a whole puzzle of, of, of pieces. And in our work with digitalization, what we're really discovering is that the, you've, got, you've got these two layers. You've got this, this digital layer, which is, which is complicated, but, but uh, predictable. And then you've got this, this um, organic uh, real world layer that is, that is very complex. And being able to, to merge the two is where a lot of the, the financial growth comes from. It's where economies can be better organized and, and be more productive, more effective. Um, and, and the linkage between those two is most often the, the, the mobile phone or, or mobile channels. 
And that, 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 that's a key piece of our, in digitalization. So coming, coming from that, what we've, what we've discovered is, is that identity proofing is perhaps the, you know, the, the most viable um, uh, methodology that we've seen happening in the different markets. We work predominantly in Africa, but we also do, do work across the developing world and particularly with identity, we've worked in the, the Pacific Islands and other places. Um, so, you know, what do we mean by identity proofing? I think, I think uh, the, the audience would, would, would probably know this be, be, better than I, but um, we, in terms of the, the fat of guidelines or, or identity proofing is, is this process of building up identities out of um, diverse identifiers. Um, if you've got circumstantial identifiers, um, it's almost like a feather, and, um, but a ton of feathers still weighs a ton. And so uh, it, it's about building an identity out of, out of data and building an, a, a digital identity where either a person doesn't have an identity and you can build a, a quite a robust identity, but it has to be as robust as what the risk it's, it's looking to um, mitigate is. So it has to be a risk appropriate uh, application of that identity. So it, it um, and this, this, this notion of, of uh, zero tolerance or zero risk is, is, is a complete fiction. We need to have something that is um, risk appropriate for, for, it doesn't matter that, that it is not 100% uh, tight. It, even if it's like 30% uh, robust, it needs to be robust for the application. If it's just for a small remittance of, of uh, $10 or $20, that is more than sufficient. But what it does is it gains somebody a foothold into the digital world and gains them a, a presence. The most important thing about the digital world is having a presence, owning a presence, and that comes from an identity, either building an identity up or a foundational identity that can be linked into the digital world or having a fully digitalized identity. And you, you really can't own your data. You can't do anything um, uh, in the digital world. You can't link into there unless you have a digital presence. And that, that for us has been one, one of the key pieces why we are looking at digitalization and the, the ability of a digital presence to, to really change the, the, the economic landscape of, of, of countries. So uh, I've, I've gone through some of the, the three ways we, we look at it. And, um, it's, it's just uh, either enhancing uh, very, very static uh, IDs or, or um, uh, using other ways to, to enhance a, a ready uh, digital uh, ID. Um, the, the issue that we, we see, with, particularly with static IDs, is that it's just one snapshot of one person at one time. Whereas a, um, an ID proof or, or a composite ID um, that, that has a whole lot of, of history of, of identifiers or cir circumstantial identifiers linked to, to it, it gives you a better sense of what the, of, of the history and of the risk of, of, a, of a consumer. And for us, it's important not only just to, to allow the consumer in to, to transact, but and to engage the consumer in uh, or the or, or the the um, market participant in in other parts of the economy, but it's also to safeguard the whole economy itself, which is which is equally important. So you need to weigh 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 the two. Um, so so those those are some some of the key things. So we we see mobile as the key uh, in generating um, and reinforcing that that, that presence. A, a reinforced uh, ID proofed um, uh, a proofed uh, identity is a lot a lot uh, more robust in terms of understanding uh, identity theft and, and other, other issues, which can uh, negatively impact um, uh, economies. If, if, you, if you just want to, uh, some, some of the, uh, the crude stats that are coming, coming out of uh, illicit flows and other, other, other issues is that in some economies, up to 10% of GDP um, can get filtered out because of, of not robust processes. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, I, I, we, can, we can continue the conversation with this, but some of the key, key pieces that, that, that are coming out are um, uh, in terms of digital, uh, digital currency or central bank digital currency. Now, this was always something that was theoretical and, and Nigeria has already issued, and we, we're working with, with other um, governments on the, on the continent. And, and also um, there are about, I think it's about 84, 85, other central banks around the world that are going to issue. And some of the key pieces that we need to look forward to is that if you don't have a digital ID or if you don't have a digitalizable identity, the potential is, is that you can get cut out of cash 
but I wouldn't say in the short term, but but ultimately you can get cut out of cash. And, and where this is where this is ultimately going is that um, proxy IDs or digital proxy IDs are becoming more important than even say bank accounts. And so that 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 level of of interaction is is really encouraging, but it's also can have a downside if if um, the digital divide is is not is not adequately um, uh, addressed. And in our, in our work, uh, I mean, this is a multi layered problem. It can go from the the uh, inefficiencies and deficiencies in devices, deficiencies in networks, regulation. Um, uh, yeah, cro cross border is, is as, as you rightly said, is, is an absolute nightmare. We work in seven different countries with with IFAD in order to to look at um, uh, customer due diligence and, and and identity, and it is it is it is quite a nightmare to to actually deal uh, uh, you know between all the different the different regulators. But working with the regulators can also be uh, very very efficient and effective. It's one of the key key barriers to, um, to utilizing a, an identity. Even a very, very good, robust identity um, can run into issues if, if the, the regulation is, is very static or, or doesn't allow for it. And, and, and I take your point on, on the, the, the sandboxes. Um, it's very important to be able to test these um, and, and to, to uh, give regulators a sense of, of, uh, of the risk that they're running or not running. So that's um, just so, some of the um, so, some of the benefits of it. Um, so what what we see is that uh, the ongoing uh, identity proofing um, is uh, you know, can cut down on, on the money laundering risk and uh, and risk mitigation. And this is not just the actual money laundering that goes up, but it's the it's the device of of restraining people from the financial sector and from and from the economic sector. I think that the impact of anti-money laundering in some domestic, uh, in some uh, developing economies is the the actual the actual um, uh, uh, regulation is, is probably more damaging than the actual money laundering. And I, and I, um, my, my my colleagues would, would would be very cross with me to say that, but but in in some instances it, it is that. So it's 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 enabling um, the regulators to 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 take a more pragmatic view, but also safeguarding the risks through effective digital identity and allowing people to engage with the system where they are with whatever device they have and at the level of risk that they pose to the system. So, so, so that, that, that for us is a very, very important aspect. Um, just some, some of the work we've done in, in the Pacific Islands told, told us that um, Many uh, uh, you know, current foundational identities are just not that um, effective in, in uh, allowing people to engage in, in the broader economy, also uh, within education, um, uh, me me medical, and in trade. Um, because often those physical IDs get, get washed away or there's, there's disasters every two years in some of the islands. And uh, it's, it's incredibly costly and log logistically intensive to, to keep on replacing them. Um, and, and yeah, so, so, so there, there's, there's a whole, whole set of, of problems around there. But what we've, we really understood from that is that those, I, I, uh, having an ID or having an ID that you can re reliably, re readily utilize that is digitalized um, can, can be mind changing and can be economically um, uplifting. For, for many people, particularly in, in diverse islands. Um, and the IFA, IFA program, just one, one anecdote from the IFA program that we've, we've learned is that just by taking away digitalizing forms and, and, and putting um, a, creating a digitalized version of, of an ID as, as Sandy had, has done with Makuru, we've done it with a couple of banks. Uh, and what it does is it allows illiterate people to engage with with uh, with agents, with banks, with others, without without the the, the fear of of uh, of not being able to fill out forms. I, I mean, those those are those, those are key key pieces that that we're finding, and it's again it's actually given an illiterate person a a digital uh, a digital space, a digital identity in uh, in the banking world. So yeah, uh, let me let me let me just stop there and see if you if you have any 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 questions you'd like to. To chat with. Well, actually, actually, Barry, uh, as always, you 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 put up some really uh, stimulating and, and controversial points. I, I wanna I wanna uh, list a couple of points that you raised, maybe four or five, 
for the audience and also for you to um, underscore if there's something that you think um, we should be paying attention to. One thing that I, I, I heard from you say is that identity is not absolute nor static. It is something that should be dynamic and risk appropriate. I think well said. That means that you know it's something that can continue to grow, continue to evolve. It's context dependent and depends on what is the application that you're using it for and what the risk model is. Without risk model, there is no identity that makes sense. Absolute identity is rigid. Um, you also mentioned that digital identity is essential for the, the central bank digital currency. If we don't have digital identities, by the time that the world is moving into um, digital credentials, then people are going to be locked out of being able to use cash. So something for governments to listen to and understand that this has to happen. Uh, static regulations are dangerous. Uh, we are, unfortunately, as you pointed out many, many times before, we've been inheriting many um, static regulations from the KYC eras that are actually dangerous. Um, the need for sandboxes, yet again, in this series, we've been calling for the need for sandboxes. Also, you mentioned that the anti-money laundering regulations sometimes have more damaging effect, have more chilling effect uh, on economic development and on people than the, the money laundering um, it, themselves, money laundering the, the uh, mechanisms themselves. Uh, are there other points that you think um, the audience should take home from those five slides that you mentioned? Yeah, could, could, could I just could qualify? So, so particularly the way that anti-money laundering is is um, is uh, in, implemented, um, and it's because it's because they they conflate risks and they don't actually um, mitigate any of the risks. That they, they 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 mitigate compliance risk only. They don't mitigate right. the real risks, and and because they've conflated it, they, they they're not really mitigating anything. Um, and and yet they pu they're putting huge penalties on 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 people that that just don't have identities, and that and that exactly. is yeah you know, that, that's unconscionable, yeah. yeah. And and in fact, it's not just in the development context. In developing countries, it's becoming harder and harder uh, for honest people to actually open up bank accounts if they are outside their jurisdiction, if they are in other countries where they, they don't have a fiscal residency, it's becoming virtually impossible unless you've been grandfathered in. Um, the Americans would testify to tell you that it's hard for them to have accounts in a European country, um, precisely because of the fear. And, and many of the banks that, that made their global bank of the world are shutting down. I mean, you, you're unable to allow somebody to move money from one bank account to another uh, because of because of these money, anti-money laundering. So what would you say is going to be needed in terms of building an assessment, risk assessment? Um, is this basically only a matter of time that, that we come together and we understand the true risks and then no, link this identity? What is it? No, these things are never inevitable. I think that they need to be really... Um, uh, designed and, and, and shepherded through, um, and particularly um, the, the, the risk methodology that, that, that's imposed, right. the um, uh, risk assessments um, that, that, that need to be um, uh, you know, analytically and empirically um, sound, um, not, not mm -hmm. just fears or ghosts of risks uh, you know, um, that, that, that people thought up. Um, and, and sometimes risks, very, very real risks that people didn't think up that, that, uh, that inevitably, um, you know, come, come to be. So, so you know, it, it's a, a detailed and, and, and very uh, accurate risk assessment as far as, as, as accurate, accurate as you can get is, 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 the, is the cornerstone of this, but also deconflating uh, any mitigation, deconflating, making, uh, linking a, a risk to the mitigation, and particularly with identity, um, understanding what identity or even even other aspects like proof of address, which 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 mitigates nothing, um, you know what what's the importance and why why are are we creating harm with without any any value, uh, and I think that that that's the key that's thing because equally um, you don't want uh, um, societies to be ravaged by illicit flows, yeah. illicit activity, and that kind of thing. So you know it's a balancing act. Uh, um, great. Barry, we ran out of time, but I look forward to continuing this discussion with you in Marrakesh and to basically continuing to bring some of your uh, thought provoking concepts um, to this community. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, um, but this is not the end of the discussion. We're going to have more. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you so much. Operator, please continue with Mark Straub for the second uh, part of this segment. Mark, smile identity, what a nice way to start. We're gonna smile and we're gonna understand um, what this is all about. I'm not gonna take any more of your time. So please, the forum is yours. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Aktik. So uh, I thought I would just um, begin this session by framing uh, my comments uh, in the context of some of the different speakers we've heard throughout the day. And uh, for those of you who don't know what Smile Identity does, uh, just a quick summary, we verify identities across Africa. We use a combination of, of textual information and visual or, or image information to verify people's identities. And we do that for businesses that are trying to expand across the continent. One of the pillars that we rely on is sources of truth. So these are commonly ID authorities. Uh, these are often government um, ID authorities. Sometimes they're, they're private sector ID authorities, uh, banks, telecoms. But um, traditionally, the concept of a legal identity has been something that is controlled by a sovereign government. And you know, as African governments begin to uh, invest in, in not just uh, physical infrastructure, but digital infrastructure, we see that, that these uh, ID authorities are actually quite critical for not just financial inclusion, but actually economic growth and expansion and dynamic um, entrepreneurial uh, economies. And so what, what I thought I would just do with some of the slides that I have prepared today is showcase a little bit of what we are seeing in markets where we're operating today and hopefully showcase a framework for how the public sector and the private sector can work together in partnership to achieve uh, our, our, our mutual goals, uh, which ultimately is, is, is economic growth, uh, um, financial uh, inclusion and financial um, uh, uh, expansion. Um, one of the things that, that people may not realize is that the, the reason why we, we end up spending so much time talking about financial inclusion is that it's actually hard to get people accounts. It's not just that people don't necessarily want them or don't see value, but it's actually difficult to get people accounts and not because they're not willing to stand in line or do the work, but typically because it's the, the constraints that are put on opening up those accounts. As we just heard from Barry, uh, whether it's sanction screening, whether it's proof of address, uh, all kinds of, of, of restrictions are placed often on people who are trying to get access to uh, payment solutions, uh, bank accounts, savings accounts, loans. In, in, in the African continent today, uh, where there are over 1.3 billion people, there are only roughly half a billion payment instruments of any kind. And the vast majority of those are actually mobile money accounts, which are not always fully KYC'd. They're not always fully digitally identity verified. Um, and if you compare that to the globe, where there's um, roughly 7 billion people, you, you've got 21 billion payment instruments. So nearly 10x more payment instrument penetration per person um, in, in the world than there is in Africa. And if you believe, that, as I do, that, that this has to change, that ultimately as infrastructure is developed, we're going to see billions, literally billions of identity verification events that have to happen to get people to the same level of payment instrument uh, penetration. And so um, the, the way to do this is, is not necessarily relying on, on old technologies or just physical ID cards or, or drivers who are, who are going to an address and checking to see whether it's valid. We actually have to start thinking about uh, digital means of identity verification. Of course, we've heard a lot from speakers today on, on different ways to do that. Um, but just to kind of paint a picture of what's possible as we've heard from the Indian examples, you know, I spent a fair bit of my career in the early days um, living and working in India and uh, working in, in microfinance. And it was really only um, a, about seven or eight years ago when the national ID system in India really came into being that we began to see what uh, a true um, economy built on digital ID can look like. And so this is what I think the future looks like for Africa over the course of the next you know, three to five years. Um, we're talking about billions of identity verification events, millions of documents that can be registered, verified, um, whether that's on a blockchain or uh, with, an, uh, with an ID authority, and ultimately a whole stack of solutions. We've heard about things called India stack, which are things like payment layers, uh, signature layers, federated documents, whether those documents are an identity document, 
or a certification uh, of, of an academic credential or a business registration. There's a whole host of things that can happen for an economy once you have that foundational identity layer. Um, and, and ultimately, we believe, uh, and I think, that governments are really best suited to provide the standards around those legal identities or foundational identities, as we've heard people talk about today. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is, is just sort of the differences in the role that I see for, for government agencies versus those for private aid uh, entities. And there is, it's really important, I think, that people who work in this space, especially people who work in the public sector, understand the benefits um, of government focusing on, on certain aspects and private sector focusing on, on other aspects. You know, governments are really well suited uh, to create standards. Um, they can decide what the format for an identity credential is going to be. They can decide on what fields are gonna be collected. They can ensure that there is quality of data collection, uh, whether that's agencies that are enrolling people or, um, or, or um, telecoms or banks that might be enrolling people in a system. Um, and ultimately they, they control the rules for, for privacy. So whether it's data protection, uh, data privacy, data permissioning, those things ultimately are best done by governments. Um, and ultimately then promoting the, the IDs. So the usage of those IDs, um, the use cases for those IDs, you know, government can uh, establish uh, general principles for that. What the public sector is really best at is building on top of those foundational identities. And that can include things like figuring out what types of claims the private sector needs to have verified. Sometimes you need to actually verify a name. Sometimes you may need to, to verify a date of birth. It might depend on what the person's trying to do, whether they're renting a motorcycle or getting a loan. And in addition to that, private entities are usually the best at figuring out how to adapt technology and apply innovation on top of these uh, ID authorities. And so biometrics, as we heard a lot about at the very beginning, whether it's face, fingerprint, um, or other modes of biometrics, voice, uh, these industries and these technologies can move very quickly. And it's usually best not to try to hard code uh, specific biometric methods or standards into an ID system that cannot then be extended or innovated on top of. So we generally see the best, the best practices happen when Government agencies are actually collecting data, verifying that data, standardizing the formats of those data. Um, but ultimately it's the private sector that then figures out the best way to verify that data with uh, claims coming from, from the wild, claims coming from the private sector or coming from the economy. So whether um, you know, one type of an account actually requires a biometric or not, um, it is usually best suited to the private industry that's engaging in that activity, whether it's insurance or loans or um, or some form of uh, securities trading. And then I think the other thing that private sector is really good at is figuring out different methods of integration. Uh, and then ultimately the compliance or consent um, interactions that it might be required to access types of data. So a government can say you need consent to get this kind of data, but it's the private sector that can figure out whether that consent should be in an iframe or a text message or um, what the best way or best time to engage a user might be in a user journey or an experience journey. I like to say that the things like consent are really about user experience. Um, and this is why people get comfortable using things like an iPhone where consent is very well designed and it's part of the user interface. Uh, whereas when you put consent into very long, complicated legal language, people get frustrated and it actually doesn't intend, it doesn't actually achieve um, the intended purpose. So private sector is best at innovating in these areas. And I think really the combination of these two things, when government focuses on standards and foundational identity and private sector focuses on verification of claims and verification of identity using technology and biometrics, you end up with better security, higher accuracy, reduced costs, uh, wider service delivery, and ultimately a more innovative economy. And so really this is the model that we see um, as, as a, a good model for the future to, to accelerate um, the digital economy. The great news is that this is actually already happening in a variety of, of, of markets across Africa. We've heard um, in previous uh, sessions about the experience in Nigeria and more recently in Tanzania. Um, and what this enables is that you can have a whole ecosystem of developers, thousands of developers or businesses or or different types of partners that can rely on some of this infrastructure without the government having to speak to every single one 
of those partners or developers and vet every single one of those entities. By creating standards, by enforcing consent, um, by um, requiring that the verification companies actually um, work within the public, secting, the, the public sector frameworks, you can have a lot of innovation and a lot of economic utility uh, for this information without uh, actually having to have government respond to every Slack message or every WhatsApp request or every uh, Twitter um, uh, uh, customer feedback. Um, and so this is what we're seeing kind of as partnerships between government and private sector um, uh, take, take place in the market. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, to, to continue, but Dr. Adek, I just wanted to see if, if there was any other questions or points you wanted to, to raise from this conversation. Yeah, actually, I think let, let's come back to, to a discussion format. I think um, <clears throat> you're, you're raising in a modest way something that's very, very fundamental, actually. You're being modest about it, but it's a very, very fundamental. And we've been talking about this, and I think it's important, which is defining the roles of the different players in the ecosystem. Some governments have taken the role that we are going to be in charge of the attestation and the enrollment and the issuance of credential, but we're also going to be in charge of verification of identity. And to me, that is opening up Pandora's box to issues such as surveillance by government and, and lack of choice to verification providers, et cetera. And so what you are showing here is a different model. It's basically saying it doesn't have to be that way. The identity authority could be the source of truth could attest, let's call it attestation, attest to my existence, my uniqueness. And then it could be third parties that are able to onboard me into program specific or functional identity. Now, what has your experience been within the African con continent and context, statistics also, about the growth of that type of model where it's the private sector that's doing the, the uh, authentication or the verification of claims? Yeah, I think this, this story is not over yet. It's, it's, it's happening in real time. And I would say even within the public sector institutions that we engage with, there can be different points of view on this very topic. Uh, and so you can have an entity where the leadership very much believes that, um, that they have a certain role, which is to create infrastructure and to create a level playing field and then allow for the private sector to come in. But you can have also sometimes um, individuals in that, in that entity that want to innovate and create things. And so government doesn't always speak with, with kind of a single voice. Um, and, and that's okay. I think it's in the early days of this whole experience. And so, um, you know, I, I think now is the time when, when successful models are beginning to emerge and hopefully the next wave of policymakers can look at what worked and what didn't and say, let's copy what worked and let's learn from what didn't. Um, I think there are some good examples now in Nigeria um, and in Kenya uh, and now increasingly in Tanzania where um, government is not having to do everything. They're doing part of the work, some of the foundational work but beginning to see the benefits and the value of creating an ecosystem around them. Um, but I think if you ask, you know, 10 different people in government, you might get, you know, six different or answers. 10 different opinions. <laughs> um, I, do, actually, I do think we're beginning to see some consensus around that model though. Actually, even in, in developing countries, which are much, much more mature and nearly developed, where you've got Adhar, for example, Adhar has from the beginning kept control over the authentic of the verification of claims process, which to me is not really necessary. And yet there are still people who are insisting that it maintains that. Um, for me, I would have basically said that, you know, if you want to know if the person exists, we are going to do that for you. And you enroll them into your health program, you enroll them into your um, banking program or financial social protection program. There's no need for every transaction to be run by the central system. Yeah, I think, and I think Adhar, it's a, it's a learning experience, right? It was one of the first major initiatives like this to happen at scale. It was also very expensive if you think about it at the time. Uh, and so if, if, you know, there's 54 countries in Africa, I don't think every single one of those governments um, necessarily wants to allocate a billion dollars to building out 
the entire ecosystem um, from scratch. And, and even in doing so, we saw many of the failure modes that Aadhaar ran into. I mean, you had agents that were onboarding people and then retaining access to data. Uh, and that was actually quite problematic. And so I, I, I don't think that Aadhaar is perfect and I think it can be improved upon. Um, and so this is one area we certainly think that, that there is room for improvement. How, how, many, how many, um, identity verification transactions are you doing per month in Africa? Yeah, uh, it's growing. Um, and one of the jokes, uh, for those of you who, who don't know me, um, there's a reason my hair is, is purple right now, or pink right now. And, and it's because our company's growing really fast. And my team, uh, asked me to do this after a successful quarter, but We've done since inception about 23 million identity verifications, and we did 12 million of those last year. We've been around Excellent. for five years, so you can imagine how fast we're growing. Excellent. Uh, hey, wonderful. I mean, I think, I think having the, the, uh, in the ecosystem entities that provide identity verifications for banks, for insurance companies, for other relying parties, that actually creates um, a trust model and a risk assessment model and, and alleviates the central government, alleviates the, uh, the identity authorities from having to do everything and, at scale, which is, which is a big, big challenge. So I'm glad to see I'm glad to see that um, we are smiling for you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we would have loved to talk to you some more, but we are definitely running out of time. If you're coming to uh, Marrakesh, we hope to see you in, in person and welcome you among our community. I will see you, you in so Morocco much. in June. Thanks, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Operator. Please bring in Gillian Hama. Gillian Hama. Um, hello, Gillian. Thank you for patiently. How are you, Dr. Attic? I am doing very <laughs> well. The important thing, how are you doing? You've been patient, but I'm I doing like, very I like well to, also. I'd like to get out of your way and give you the forum. Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. I will share my screen and then just run through a few slides and then we can have a quick conversation around it. Um, so very quickly, I wanted to just talk about digital accessibility as really a key driver for economic inclusion. And it's, I'll use Ghana as a case study, and I will use Data Bank as an investment bank as a, a sub case study within that, just to give you a bit of background. Data Bank is the largest investment bank. It's actually the first investment bank in Ghana. And from there, we, we've been around this month. Next week will actually be 32 years. So we're the first and the largest. So the, the reason why that even matters is that as part of that, we have had to keep trying to, to provide investors and, and our clients with ways to transact from wherever they are. So I wanted to just start and give yours just a regional perspective of why this is important. In 2004, the World Economic Forum, they launched what is called a Global Competitiveness Index. Um, really interesting. They release the results every so often, but the most recent results were in 2019. And essentially what they do is they have taken 141 countries across the world that represent 99% of world GDP. And then they have measured them across four key areas. Um, oh, sorry. The, how enabling their environment is, the human capital, the markets, how resilient the markets are, and how innovative the countries are. From a regional standpoint, Sub-Saharan Africa, is the least competitive across the world. And East Asia and the Pacific, they are the, the most competitive led by Singapore. Now, the problem is that if we are to help drive economic inclusion, we cannot continue to be at the bottom of the list. Like we need to take up certain things to now bring uh, digital inclusion and accessibility to Ghanaians. So, Two of the pillars that I picked on um, with this survey are ICT adoption and then financial systems. And when you look at the chart, you see a bunch of blue boxes, but really the darker the shade of blue, the better the performance of that region. The lighter the shade, um, then 
the poorer the performance. So sub-Saharan Africa is right at the bottom. Now, when you look at Ghana as a by itself, we need, when it comes to ICT adoption, we rank 90th out of 141 countries. When you look at the strength of our financial systems, we rank 116 out of 141 countries. And we, when you look at the score of how competitive we are, out of a total of 800, we're at 49. So we really need to put more focus and more work around um, ICT and financial systems and marrying the two together. So I wanted to just give just a quick overview of the Ghanaian investment industry. And because in it, there's both problems and opportunities. So the size, the current assets under management within the investment industry, this was as at the end of December, 2021. It was 44 billion CDs, local currency, so about $7 billion. So our industry is still relatively young. Um, we're growing. So the size of the industry is small. We have a total of 85 fund managers, not all of whom are very active. We have 46 new. Is that we don't even have enough financial solutions for the people. But then again, it's the opportunity because then it shows that there is still so much room for growth if we would like to, to reach out to Ghanaian. So that's the first thing. The second part of the opportunity versus problem is that when you look at, in our recent census, um, 2021, last year, the preliminary report showed that we have 10 million, just over 10 million Ghanaians living in two of Ghana's 16 regions. So that's 35% is concentrated in only two regions. You still have 65% that is woefully underserved. Even within the two regions, 95% of the limited investment banks that are there, investment companies, are situated only in Accra. So we will never get there. We will never get to economic inclusion on the back of feet on the ground and people walking from one place to another. It has to be based on a digital agenda. And so that is the opportunity that is coming from the problem that we face. Now, Data Bank in 2018 decided to roll out our... Um, our digital platforms, both mobile, so through USSD and online using Visa and MasterCard. We rolled out that uh, side of our business. And so in the last five years, we've actually seen growth well over a thousand percent in that line of business. Interestingly enough, though, 88% of the transactions within the digital space is coming through USSD. And that is what we, as an industry, as a nation, we need to sit up and recognize that. So when this, this slide is just an example of the kinds of options we try to give to our clients, where we are showing them that it is we're recognizing mobile is a game changer. You can't get away from it. So it's about how many options can you provide to your clients? The key thing though, is that we are now stuck between accessibility and increased KYC, where if USSD is the driver of the future, certainly, and the, the regulators are trying to now also increase KYC to cut down fraud and all of that, there's a tug of war because the, the regulator is asking us to collect more and more data, USSD, you can't pile it with request after request after request. So when you think about um, even the session length, when you are when a client is using USSD, they have a 15 second limit in order to answer any question or enter any details that you want. Rule of thumb says you should have about 10 screens, maybe that they go through, not anymore. The regulator recently came a few months ago and now our paper application forms have gone from four pages to eight. How do you marry that with digital? 
how do you marry that with USSD? That, that's a big challenge for us. So the other challenge too is identity. Again, Ghana is actually moving towards a single national ID, which in and of itself is a great idea. It, it, that's not a problem. But the issue that we have is we don't have databases that talk to each other. So you have the National Identification Authority that is holding the data for the Ghana card. You have another company that currently most financial institutions use to verify data. They don't validate the Ghana card. And so National Identification Authority is holding on to their portion. This company is holding on to their portion. And we're not able to seamlessly verify IDs. So it's a really big deal, both for clients with local IDs, and then those who live abroad. It, it's a major issue for us. So really what I wanted to just touch on Dr. Attic, and it's very similar to what a few others have said, but I think one of the most important things that we will need to see happen as the way forward is the graduated KYC levels. So it's that risk-based approach where a client who has 200 CDs or 300 CDs doesn't necessarily need to give us eight pages of documentation. We should be able to onboard clients at different levels. And as they grow, as their transaction amounts grow, yes, we collect more information from them. So that's one. The second thing that we really need is collaborative databases. We need databases that talk to each other. We can't just um, sit and have people in different corners because then you get IDs falling through the cracks. We're unable to verify. The other thing that we need to just sort out is the capping of electronic fees because that's also an issue for accessibility. If there is no control over the fees for using digital channels, it will become a deterrent. And then when you look at data control, again, it is something that we, the, the more of a digital agenda you adopt, the more you need to go down the path of data control and, and managing cybersecurity risks. So at a high level, those are the key things that I think we really need to touch on if we want to increase digital accessibility. So I'll pause here and then... Yeah, maybe stop next. sharing and then we can have a discussion. Yeah, actually, there is something that seems to be recurrent in every one of the presentations and every one of the discussions that we've been having, not just today, but all across, which is that in a way, the regulations seem to be not compatible with the reality of where we are Correct. today and the channels that we use. Who, who and what is informing um, the, the financial regulations in Ghana or in Africa? I mean, do you think they're simply taking the sort of the international community's set of regulations and then, and then trying to implement them locally without paying attention to the fact that they are not compatible with where Ghana is or where Africa is? I think, so there's some element of that where they are looking at international regulations and it's, it's informing the kind of data that we need to collect. What I think we need to do is layer on top of that the context of our country and our, our, our continent. And that's where I think the disconnect is. The second part is that most regulators, and I don't think it's only Ghana, are very under-resourced. They don't even have the systems to check um, what they're asking for. So what they've done is, it's as, almost as if they've tried to slow everybody down by asking them to collect information that they still actually can't verify. But it's, it's that tug of war um, that we're facing. We're seeing this, by the way, the regulatory landscape is getting worse and worse in even the developed countries. Uh, we're having a breed of regulators that are not really pro-business. So all they're doing is sort of pro-progress because they're afraid that there will be uh, uh, an event that would create a scandal, create a problem. Yes. The, the true risk models are hard to come by. No one is really spending time, just like Barry said, building the right risk model. It's always easier to say no or give you a barrier mm -hmm. that you have to get over 
than to enable um, the business. It, it is a frustrating issue because it is holding back the growth. Um, another question for you is you mentioned that the invested assets um, were on the order of seven billion US dollars. Is that is that did I understand that in Ghana? Yes. About, under management, yeah. Under management, under management. Um, what would you say the um, the investable assets, the potential that's out there that is not under management, um, people keeping their money under the table or under the, the <laughs> mat mat matrix? <laughs> the, uh, what, what is the target that, that you're going for? You know, it, it's. I think the target can be looked at both in terms of number of bodies that you onboard into the investment space, as yes. well as money. So, I don't have that. That question is is a bit of a, a tricky or a difficult question. But if you even look at the amount of money that changes hands, so for example, I think it was twenty twenty, there was. Over 500 billion CDs changed hands just through mobile money. 500 so, billion CDs? Billion. Billion. In, in yes. Ghana, in, in Ghana so, alone? In Ghana alone. In Ghana alone. So the, the amount of money that is flowing through these channels is immense. But we, we, we struggle because we don't have the, the requisite tools to capture that money, especially if you move out of the regional capital. Mm -hmm. So you don't have, there are people who are sitting in other regions with lots of money, but nobody is going to them. So yeah, they are there no, and they're using it to, to just putting it under their mattress um, because okay. no one is reaching out to them to say, here, let me help. Yeah, I mean, if so, the money sitting under the mat mattress, they're not, investing it there's not contributing to the economic development of the country it seems to me um does data bank in, in invest in public relations campaigns explaining to people the the art of and the importance of building a future and and, and building a retirement fund and investing mm -hmm. in the future do you do, do you do that in the rural areas we do um still we have not it is something that we do, and I think we do it more than any other company or even the regulator um, themselves. But it's still a drop in the bucket compared to mm -hmm. what needs to be done. And you find that the further out you go into the rural communities, the less trust there is um, also. So it's COVID has helped. COVID has helped speed up just digital acceptance, even with people in the rural communities. But there's still the need to educate them about investment products, which um, we, we're still doing, but language barriers are there. You have all of these different things. And even when you talk to them, they don't have the requisite IDs for you to even right. now bring them into the fold. So that's right. also a challenge. Well, a, a, final, a final thing, because um, we're running out of, of time. Um, how much of the 7 billion under management comes from the formal sector? I would say probably at least 90%, 80 to That's 90%. It. That, that of continues it. To, be, to be the problem. Yeah. I mean, pensions yeah. for people yeah. in rural areas and in the informal sector, the gig economy, they are not included no matter what you do you can give them a bank account but if they are, don't have a digital presence and they don't have um, participation in the investment world etc they would still be outside so this is yes. a problem between formal and informal economies uh continues to be, to be the case julian thank you so much for your insights we ran You're out welcome. of time see you again You're at welcome. some point take in the care future. okay thank you thank you all so right. much okay You're and welcome. for all for all um of you who have st stuck with us till the end. I want to thank you very much for uh, yet staying with us for another fantastic episode, rich with information. And I promise you the fourth episode in this series is going to be just as fascinating uh, where we are going to tackle 
the advanced economies. We are going to have a glimpse of the future um, and not just of the challenges of today. Uh, but today, today was just also fantastic. We had a lot of insights about the challenges, but also the hope. We see a lot of activities going on on the, in, on the continent, enabled by the convergence of mobile identity, mobile and digital identity. And so with that, I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. And in the meantime, please stay safe and, and, and until we meet again. Thank you.